Welcome to the July 7th, 2020 electronic meeting of the Ann Arbor Planning Commission. This meeting is in accordance with the executive orders from the governor to affect social distancing and mitigate the spread of COVID-19 virus. We intend, we intend to conduct this meeting similar to an in-person meeting. However, please be patient if there are any technical issues. Uh, public comment will be via telephone only. To speak during the public comment opportunities, please call 877-853 5247 and enter meeting ID 976-0979-8997. This information is also available on the published agenda in the public notices section of the city website and on the broadcasts of this meeting on CTN channel 16, ET t channel 99, and online at www.a2gov.org slash watch CTN. We will begin with a roll call. Commissioner Woods. Present. Commissioner Briggs. Here. Commissioner Mills. Here. Commissioner Milstein. Here. Commissioner Gib Randall. Here. Commissioner Ackerman. Here. Commissioner Sove. Here. Commissioner Abrams. I call you. I didn't hear you, but I see you. And Commissioner Hammerschmidt. Here. We have a full house. Excellent. Um, do we have any introductions this evening? We do not. Great. Uh, then moving on to approval agenda. Do you have a commissioner that will move the agenda? Moved by Commissioner Wood, seconded by Commissioner Mills. Any discussion or changes to the agenda? Seeing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Right. It's approved. Um, next item is the June 16th, 2020 uh, Planning Commission meeting minutes. Do you have a commissioner that will move those? Moved by Commissioner Sove, seconded by Commissioner Briggs. Any discussion or changes on the minutes? Seeing nobody. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? They are approved. Uh, moving on to reports, and we will begin with our uh, report from our city council representative, Commissioner Ackerman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm off mute. Um, so a number of updates from our city council meeting uh, last night that I want to uh, let you know about, some of which you all have been following actively, um, and then some that, that affect the work plan of this body. Um, so, uh, you know, one, a, a quick one is the city's partnering with Ann Arbor Township um, and Washtenaw County uh, to, to buy a new um, property in um, our conservation easement on a property to add to our Greenbelt in Ann Arbor Township. Um, also, uh, um, Systems Planning presented uh, some updates about um, new technology uh, that they'd be procuring in order to uh, better prioritize our uh, capital improvements plan. That is, how do you prioritize the billion dollars worth of capital improvements, real infrastructure that we need to build over the next uh, five to 10 years? Um, and the, uh, and as we input more, um, you know, variables into our prioritization, such as, um, you know, the, the strategies in the 820 plan, this technology will be flexible enough to allow us to do that um, and to create different models and scenarios to best plan how we spend tons of, of public dollars. Um, so we were uh, able to move forward with the acquisition of, of that technology last night. Um, uh, also uh, cosmetic changes to our unified development code that this body recommended to city council. Um, there were some redundancies with, between what we request in area plans and site plans and also some inconsistencies around things like ALTA surveys. Uh, do we require them on-site versus off-site? Um, and city council approved those at second reading last night um, at your recommendation. Um, the uh, city council also passed a resolution uh, requesting that the city administrator um, and, and by extension planning staff explore um, how we may reduce the burden that site plan applicants for small projects have to go through and review. So right now, there are some small projects that require in-depth and very expensive site plans 
uh, in the review of those and the approval all the way to city council. Um, and we'll be looking at ways to uh, maybe reduce some of that burden for the smallest developments that come through our pipeline. Um, so that, that's very exciting um, and, and we'll play a role in that, uh, obviously. Um, in terms of items that you all have been following and expressed interest in, the Healthy Streets Initiative, which is the city's uh, initiative to close down some lanes of traffic in order to allow um, better walking and biking and allow for social distancing in the midst of the COVID pandemic, um, move forward both in downtown Ann Arbor and outside of downtown um, last night. So we'll begin a 90 day pilot to test how that goes. Um, and I'm optimistic that residents will, will find it useful um, not only to, to get out of their house and get around town, um, but also to stay, 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 stay safe, excuse me. Um, two larger items that are gonna come to the Planning Commission for your input and, and review. One is the C1A and C1AR zoning districts. These have been a topic of conversation really only in the last three years since 2017. Their zoning codes, uh, their zoning districts in our code that were created in the 1960s for mixed use um, building in the near campus area. Um, and then notably, they were the zoning districts that were applied for for the Morningside development at Broadway and the Garnet development on Summit. Um, City Council has instituted a moratorium on rezoning to those two designations, C1A and C1AR and request that in the next 180 days, Planning Commission provide our recommendations on how we may um, update or, uh, or remove C1AR from our zoning codes, C1A and C1AR, excuse me, from our zoning codes. Um, you know, th this isn't, you know, I, I'm skeptical of moratoriums generally, but I think any zoning code that was written in the 1960s is well worth our examination. Uh, and I look forward to us being able to work together to find uh, ways to, to leverage this zoning district to meet more of our goals. I think in a lot of ways um, it, it, it does. And in some ways I'm sure we can refine and improve and modernize. Um, so I, I, I wanna I look at it as an opportunity. Um, the, uh, the other uh, area where city council is, it will be seeking your, your guidance and partnership um, and participation is with the pre-entitlement of 415 West Washington. Um, this uh, passed uh, narrowly last night, but as you know, 415 West Washington is an old Roads Commission building um, that's been deteriorating over the past um, several decades uh, and is the site of, of some, some contamination. Um, it also sits in the floodway and the floodplain. So it has all the makings of a very complex site. It's publicly owned. It has failing retaining walls on one side um, and it's also been identified as a key anchor along the, uh, um, the tree line trail uh, by the Allen Creek Conservancy. So lots of different um, interests and priorities from the community, from affordable housing to park space, um, to, to commercial use, um, to the tree line trail and everything in, below, uh, in between, um, including flood mitigation. Um, so a lot going on on site um, and staff did a, a great job of engaging the public and, and putting forward what could potentially be the, the makings or the massing of a building that accomplishes all of those goals. Um, never to everyone's liking, but it does the best of accomplishing all of those goals. And we'll be, um, you know, taking the, a, a significant leadership uh, role in helping shape what those details pan out to be, um, because we want to, to provide uh, all of the, the zoning and, and potentially, you know, site plans for a developer who would then come in to build it uh, in partnership with the city. Um, so, so that's an exciting update. Um, and, and a big thanks to Jennifer Hall, Derek Delacourt, and Brett Leonard um, for their, their leadership last night in, in helping um, city council to move that forward. Sounds like we're going to have a great time uh, with a lot of great, interesting projects over the next couple of months. So it's like fun. Um, Commissioner Gibrandall, sounds like you have a question. I, yeah, I have a question. Um, so what, so this is coming to us in some way, shape or form, I guess I just want a little bit of clarification on what our role would be with 415. Brad, I'll let you speak to the process. Mr. Yeah, Lester. sure. The, the city is, uh, through two resolutions now is, uh, approaching publicly owned properties and I 
different way than we have in the past. Um, for uh, both the former Y lot at 350 South Fifth, that resolution was previously passed by City Council in la last evening for 415. What we're calling this is actually the city initiating pre entitlement activities. And what we envision in that is for the city to actually, um, under the, the sort of lens and feedback from community engagement, as opposed to a private developer, start the actual entitlement of that property, potentially including uh, plan unit development with supplemental regulations, doing some of the background of uh, pre preliminary concept planning or area planning for that site and presenting that to the city council ultimately for the opportunity to uh, both constrain and set forth the expectations for development of that site prior to then engaging development partners for that site. Um, city council started this work on um, a variety of sites and put sort of an elevated community engagement focus on these two sites specifically the y lot and 415 west washington and so what our intention to do is to um, start with the a project an option for both of them that we think meets the the goals that came out of the community engagement process by no means is it unanimous. There's a lot of different perspectives in our community about how to use these sites. But our goal is to perhaps um, advance them to a point where we can clearly as a city communicate to the development community at the appropriate time what our expectations are and frankly add some value because some decisions have already been rendered in regards to what can be realized there as opposed to somebody starting from scratch. And so your role will be um, in a very typical way to review petitions associated with these sites. The distinction here is those petitions are probably going to be originating from a public partner um, as opposed to a private entity. And, and there will likely be dollars associated with this, hopefully coming from the DDA. So it's it's not as though staff in-house or us have to come up with that concept, nor should we come up with that concept mm -hmm. ourselves. Um, it's going to be the product of public input translated into you know, professional drawings for our review. So I, I know that there were a number of sites that were presented because Jennifer Hall came and presented to the DDA partners group too. And um, just from previous work I've done in that area and collaborations with other professionals, there are some serious issues for this site. And I'm just wondering, is there even a role for us to be able to talk about some of those things in regards to this site or is that ship sailed? Because there's a bunch of infrastructure issues around it that are really problematic yeah. that, that are not even on the property itself, but are the connections to the property. So is that like done or is are there still because she presented like a number of sites that all had like various pros and cons, some of which were a whole lot more straightforward than this one. So I'm just yeah. wondering is our role at all in this what's coming at us to kind of think about what some of those other constraints could be and whether it may be more appropriate to think about some of the other sites that were on the table as part of that exploration or is that done um well it's 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 both so city council has directed us to start the work on this site and that that sort of dialogue is definitely welcomed um, you're right, this is an incredibly challenging site. And that I think you, um, that's been one of the thread of discussion is that um, in trying to meet um, numerous goals for this, this site, um, it's really challenging. Um, when you consider the environmental cleanup potential, the infrastructure potentials, the floodway and floodplain impacts of this site. Um, on top of that, um, this site is located in a historic district, so the character has to be of a quality and character that's going to be ultimately approvable under historic preservation ordinances. Um, all of that, frankly, leads to um, our putting together a project that we think gives us the best chance to achieve a variety of community goals. But I think we were pretty clear with City Council last evening, um, specifically as it relates to affordable housing, this is probably a, a best chance but it's still challenging from that lens because of the other factors on this site. So the, the sort of starting point from a, a concept that we will be um, uh, you know, now starting to fine tune is going to take into account certainly infrastructure connections. That's part of the review of cities, um, various city departments and the like, but also just um, starting to dive into a little bit more detail about 
um, it is is all of this to what extent can we be successful when you layer on all those those um, challenges to the site and opportunities i think i don't th I think i also mentioned the chimney swift habitat preservation um, there's a lot of constraints here and so um, the option that we've had a lot of community conversation about is uh, is of a significant size that we think it has the opportunity to leverage investment to achieve many of those goals. Um, certainly, if that is unpalatable to the city as for the use of this resource at the end of the day, then we're gonna have to figure out other resources and other ways to maybe approach some of those goals if we can achieve all those goals uh, at all. So, um, so that, but that's a long way of saying that's definitely welcome on this site. There will be more conversations on the other site. City Council has directed conversations on all the sites. Yeah, the inclusion doesn't preclude action on the others. In fact, we've taken action on other sites, for example, Catherine uh, and the Y lot, um, and hope to do so on others. And, and frankly, this doesn't rank as highly on, you know, the on the prioritization. It's just, yeah. And so, yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mr. Liner, do you have a report for us? Um, just want to update you. Um, uh, come, uh, Commissioner Ackerman uh, referenced a couple of uh, impacts to the Planning Commission work plan based on action from City Council last night. Um, I'm going to get started on that work with you next week at the working session. Um, as it relates to the resolutions regarding C1A and C1AR, as well as site plan review thresholds and communications. Um, I'm scheduling both those items for the working session next week. Um, I will acknowledge that I'm going to be probably more just kind of dumping some data, some background as I can gather in advance of that meeting. Also trying to um, summarize some of the conversation that occurred at the council table regarding the passage of these resolutions. And I'll be asking you as the commission to help um, with questions, directions, um, sort of paths to explore. Um, and then probably from the full commission lens, that those will go away for a little while. And I anticipate some frequent discussions at the ORC meeting, but I think the ORC might find the sort of full commission sort of starting brainstorming beneficial to guide that work before they deliver ultimately something back to the full commission for consideration. Thank you. Uh, Planning Commission officers and committees. Uh, Commissioner Mills. Thanks. I just thought I would report out to everyone that the ORC did meet two weeks ago um, and we reviewed uh, staff's um, work on the plan projects list. And so again, that is to try to make more specific what the benefits are that we're looking for. Um, we also had a really robust discussion about whether there's limits on effectively the changes that could be made, how much additional height or how much closer to the property lines um, you, you know, are viable or farther away from the property lines where we have a maximum setback distance. So I think that there's, there was lots of good discussion and I think that Alexis is making a lot of great progress on that, um, but just wanted to report out that it is moving. Thank you. Any other uh, committees or officers? All right. We received quite a bit of written communication, so please take a look at that when you have an opportunity. And we now come to um, audience participation. This is an opportunity for persons to speak for up to three minutes about an issue that is not listed as a public hearing on this agenda. To comment on such other matters, please call 877-853-5247 and enter meeting ID 976-0979-8997. This information is also displayed on the meeting agenda and video feed. City staff will select callers that have raised their hand using the last three digits of your phone number. In order to electronically raise your hand to indicate your desire to speak, please press star nine on your phone. You'll hear an automated announcement that the host is allowing you to speak. When speaking, please move to a quiet area and mute any television or background sounds so that we may hear you clearly. Please state your name and address at the beginning of your comments. So once again, this is audience participation for items that we will not be discussing in our agenda uh, later on this evening. So if you'd like to address the Planning Commission, please press star nine. 
Let's give it a moment here. No indication of speakers. Thank you. Uh, public hearing scheduled for the next business meeting. We are, uh, we have numerous public hearings scheduled for your next meeting. Uh, this next meeting will be on Tuesday, July 21st. Uh, the following projects are scheduled for a new public hearing at that. We have the Argo livery public project. This is a proposal to that includes the expansion of an existing restroom, paving an existing gravel parking lot, replacing sidewalks, along with boat and fishing docks and adding an accessible kayak launch, rain garden, bike racks, benches and wayfinding sign to the park at 1055 Longshore Drive. Um, just as a reminder, this is, um, while it is a public project, typically not subject to zoning, City Council directs us to review such projects and advise them about how it would meet or wouldn't meet typical private development standards. We also have Broadway Park West. This is a proposed plan unit development site plan to, to, for a mixed use development consistent with the proposed PUD zoning districts and supplemental regulations for the 13.8 acre site located at 841 Broadway Street. It proposes 96 residential units, two-story parking garage, 148 room hotel, 13,800 square feet of retail restaurant space, public open space with recreational amenities and uh, outdoor pavilion open space and river access. We have proposed amendments to chapter 55 of the Unified Development Code, section 5.25 lighting to replace the existing exterior lighting standards, with new standards that minimize adverse impacts of lighting on the built and natural environment, to promoting energy efficiency and supporting enhancing commerce and, and lawful night activities. And we have also a series of proposed amendments to chapter 55 of the Unified Development Code. These are a combination of sort of cleanup and amendments um, I'm going to go through them relatively quickly. Amendments to the accessory use table uh, to allow accessory dwelling units in the R2A district. Amendment to the security for completion of improvements to allow uh, financial security bonds to be posted for all required site plan improvements. Amendment to the building design requirements on primary and secondary streets to prohibit fiber cement products as a facade material. Amendment to section 5.17.4 mixed use zoning districts to allow area dedicated as right of way for new or widened public sidewalks to be considered as part of lot area. Number five, amendment to correct the fence graphic label in the section 5.26 fences. Number six, an amendment to correct a footnote in the mixed use zoning district dimensions. Number seven, an amendment to correct marijuana infused product processor as permitted use in the M1, M1A, and M2 districts. And number eight, reformatting tables 5171 through 5 uh, to a landscape orientation and incorporating more of the footnotes right into the applicable standards for a quicker reference by users of the code. And that is all scheduled for the July 21st meeting. That's going to be a great meeting. 24, 24. Um, all right, moving on to uh, unfinished business. And before us this evening, we have two items on our agenda for unfinished business. Um, the way we will take them up is the petitioner will have 10 minutes to address the Planning Commission in regards to their presentation. Um, we'll then head to staff report, followed by a public hearing, then a motion, uh, discussion, and a vote. Um, so the first item in our unfinished business um, is Liberty Town Home Site Plan for City Council approval. Give me a moment to promote everybody into our meeting. And I think that's everybody I have listed that I see in the attendee petitioners. Let me know if you are aware of somebody that um, I have not included. Feel free to turn on your video and your microphones and you may begin as soon as you do that. Um, thank you, Planning Commissioners. I'll begin with a little intro. Um, the applicants team um, is here and they can um, add in as necessary. Um, a small bit of recap. This is a project for a 52 dwelling unit um, apartments 
in nine three-story buildings on a 4.6 acre site zoned R4B. Um, this site is on the west side of the town on West Liberty at I-94. The site plan uh, was postponed by Planning Commission at its June 2nd meeting. Um, we had recommended it being postponed to allow for review of some newly um, prepared driveway configurations um, for the site. Um, and um, specifically about that, staff found the previous driveway design, which did restrict left turns out of the site because there's not enough site distance to Liberty, the Liberty Bridge over I-94. It didn't allow emergency vehicles to return to service by turning left um, in an acceptable time frame. Um, the applicant's engineer has um, had and has designed a driveway treatment to direct vehicles to exit right onto Liberty, but it will allow large wheelbase vehicles such as fire trucks and ambulances to exit left if needed. As before, the guardrail will be pulled back from the new driveway. And in addition, this project will reconstruct the driveway approach to South Maple Park, which is directly across the street. Um, we'll remove a little pavement from the driveway's west side and give it a curb so that it is further offset from the Liberty Townhomes driveway and discourage any uh, straight across movements so that they won't be using that as a U-turn. Um, these changes make the project comply with the International Fire Code standards um, and planning staff confirm that the site layout meets all applicable requirements. I'll mention one thing. There was a question also about uh, parking stall counts and uh, each unit has a each unit has a garage which counts as one space. Um, and in addition, there are 53 surface parking spaces. So it's got 105 required off street parking spaces. Now each garage is a tandem space, so it has two spaces, only one of which count. Um, so the site can accommodate 157 vehicles, but we're only counting 105. Um, staff recommends that the uh, Liberty Townhome site plan and development agreement be approved, um, as mentioned or as articulated in the staff report. Um, we have access to a detail of the design, the driveway treatment design, if you, we can screen share if um, if you like. Um, if it helps the discussion, just let us know. Um, and um, at this point, I will um, ask if the um, engineer or the landscape architect would like to add anything further. Uh, thank you, Alexis. Uh, I think you covered everything pretty well. Um, aside from the changes to the approach on Liberty um, for the development and the adjustment to the driveway across the street, this is the identical site plan that was in front of you last time. Um, meeting all ordinances and codes and, and um, we're here hoping for a recommendation of approval and we'll answer any questions you'd like if you want to bring up that detail if anybody's had a chance to look at that and had any questions of specifics so we'll go right ahead. Great. Um, all right. So I will open up the public hearing on this item. Um, this is an opportunity for persons to speak for up to three minutes about the proposed site plan for Liberty Townhomes at 2658 West Liberty. Public comment may be made by calling 877-853-5247 and then entering meeting ID 976-0979. 8997. This information is also displayed on the meeting agenda and video feed. City staff will select callers that have raised their hand one by one using the last three digits of your phone number. In order to electronically raise your hand after dialing into the meeting, please press star nine on your phone. You'll hear an automated announcement once the host is allowing you to speak. When speaking, please move to a quiet area and mute any television uh, or background sounds so that we may hear you clearly. Please state your name and address um, for the record at the beginning of your comments. Commissioners, I also have one um, email inquiry where the, they were unable to raise their hand using the selection. Um, would you be comfortable uh, accommodating a three minute general audience participation at this time as well? Sure. 
Hello, caller ending with number 194. Um, you have up to three minutes to address the Planning Commission. And thank you. I appreciate this accommodation, but I'm actually, I wasn't clear to me that I was intending to speak on the public hearing that's later. So if, if you could help me later, that would be great. Yep, no problem. I appreciate it. All You're right, welcome. thank you. And nobody else is indicating an interest in speaking. Um, I will close the public hearing and I will read the motion. The Ann Arbor City Planning Commission hereby recommends that the Mayor and City Council approve the Liberty Townhome Site Plan and Development Agreement. Moved by Commissioner Mills, seconded by Commissioner Woods. Uh, we are in discussion. Uh, Commissioner Briggs, followed by Commissioner Gibrandall. Yeah, thanks. So I appreciate the um, revisions that have been made since the last time and sort of the work that's happened to uh, reconfigure the driveway. There was one question that um, still is kind of lingering for me and there was, uh, I was trying to figure out um, how sort of staff was reconciling um, this comment um, from engineering staff. It says that um, Transportation engineering continues to remind the planning commission that residents must turn west away from downtown and nearby shopping and services without a convenient way to return to the easterly travel. Nearby side streets may be used to turn around. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out how, I mean, this isn't like one or two houses, we're talking about 52 units here. Um, how that's not creating a nuisance in that area and how you're reconciling that that as a, you know, the, that issue. Uh, sure. Um, unfortunately, as you know, we, we can't do left turns from this location. Um, and even it is a 50 unit, two unit development, but um, this was a question that came up early in the review process and uh, our traffic engineer did an analysis to determine, you know, peak hour trips and how many people would be making trips to the east and how many west and the peak hour AM was eight cars in that peak hour in the morning and peak PM was four. Um, so yes, there are cars that will that'll wanna go east that are gonna be forced to go west. Um, they may turn around on one of the boulevard developments to the west. They may go, I'll say around the block the long way, which is a long trip. Um, that's unfortunately gonna be up to them to decide which way, what alternate route they would have to take to, to return back east. So it, it, is, it is a fact, um, but it's a limited number of vehicles. Um, Alexis, do you have any other thoughts on that as well? Um, I think that what the traffic engineers are doing is acknowledging that there is a concern and that the this is not a perfect ideal development or design but it meets all of our standards and it is very hard to regulate behavior i know that a goal of the vision zero um, effort that transportation in the city is is in is design something to try to influence behavior um, but we we grapple with this in planning a lot um you know with projects where you just have a feeling that it's not you have a feeling that people are not going to follow the rules but you can't um you you can't punish people for what you think is going to happen and i think that the transportation engineers are just wanting to be clear that this is not ideal but it does meet all of our standards and it it can and should be approved um, because it is um, it is good enough, meaning it meets the minimum standards. That's yeah, that's helpful. I mean, I, I think I'm less concerned about the idea that people may be um, not following the rules and turning a, a different direction and more actually what happens if they do follow the rules and um and do as what is designed to me that suggests that we're actually creating 
conflict in that area and that this project is actually kind of problematic. So I'm, that's what I'm struggling with. So I'll. Yeah, I will note that um, the uh, Cynthia Redinger, the traffic engineer, is available to participate in the call um, immediately. I will also mention that, you know, in regard to driver behavior and behavior, there's always a chance that um, this project will have an unusually high number of people who take alternative transit um, or bike or take a bus. And so, you know, things sometimes don't play out the way we anticipate. And sometimes that's for the better. Commissioner Gibrandal, and then I have Commissioner Woods. Um, could you share the the design of the the turnout under Liberty? I just have a question about it. Yeah, sure, Brett. That's in the PowerPoint um, on a a middle slide. So I, I noticed in the report that it said that um, a, a vehicle with a large wheelbase can kind of take that left. And I'm just curious what happens to a, a, a car who decides to take the risk. I'm just curious, do they bottom out? Do they like, what, what happens um, when, when somebody just says, I'm gonna forget, it, I'm just gonna try. <laughs> I'm just curious kind of how it's designed is uh, in terms of um, like what, what what would happen? I, I'll refer that one to um, the designer, John Curry. Sure. Um, a, I guess a very low wheelbase car would could potentially bottom out. Um, more than anything, it's it would be difficult to maneuver. There is a four inch island in the middle. Um, there's rumble strips, and it is graded and curved such a way as that it it discourages from going that direction. Someone could jump over that and drive over the rumble strips and make that left turn. Um, what we've done is make it as uninviting and as unattractive to try to make that maneuver as possible, as well so, as traffic control signage prohibiting it. Right, 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 yeah. No, I get it, and I think that it makes sense. I was just kind of curious what what would actually happen if somebody somebody really tried it. So they, they wouldn't necessarily damage their car. It's just kind of uncomfortable is what I'm hearing you say. Correct. Okay, all right. Now certain sports cars could possibly bottom out on that four inch island, but right, most right. your SUVs and things wouldn't. That, that'd be pretty low, right. Yeah. So it's designed for a wider wheelbase, but also a higher carriage. Is that what I'm hearing? Correct, more than anything, it's as far as the wider wheelbase, it's, um, it's wide enough that the ladder truck can fit through it um got it okay so a normal car could fit through it too right they could. Um, but it but it's just okay all right so it's not like literally designed just for the big emergency vehicles it's designed just to make it uncomfortable to be able to go across there and obviously signed and things like that yes it's, it's big it's uh designed to allow those emergency vehicles to go through so they can make that turn but discourage and make very uncomfortable anybody else trying to do it. Okay. Alrighty. I was just I was just curious how it functions. So thank you. Commissioner Woods. Followed by Commissioner Mills. Uh, I'm glad to see that some changes have been made to the project. Um, uh, one question I have is once someone turns right out of the um, out of the development and goes over the bridge, that's no longer the city of Ann Arbor. Am I correct about that? Is that then, um, is that style? Yes. Okay, so those housing developments on the other side of 94, that's not actually Ann Arbor, is that correct? Correct. No, the, um, the north side is the city of Ann Arbor all the way until Wagner. But the south okay. side, but the south side is Sio Township. Um, but the neighborhoods on the north side, which I'm just now, uh, Liberty Glen. Liberty Glen. And and then there is a uh, um, some commercial office uh, development, and there's another residential street. But those are all. Um, That's still Ann Arbor. Yep, all of Ann Arbor, all the way to Wagner. Okay, I was just uh, not raising something necessarily, but. Um, there may be some pushback from neighbors who will not like getting uh, 
folks coming into their neighborhood and turning around increased traffic or whatever, just so that um, our council will be aware of that possibly in the future, um, that that could be an issue. And I was just thinking in my head where people might turn around anyway. Um, and I, you know, there certainly is the residential area. And then on the other, the south side, I guess there are a couple of other properties where folks may, may turn around. But, um, but uh, hopefully it won't become too problematic. But, but I was a little surprised that the low number of presumed um, traffic counts for that time of, uh, of the morning. I live uh, off of Liberty, but uh, closer to town. And uh, on school mornings on particular weekdays, there, there's quite a bit of traffic coming on, um, on Liberty Road. So um, I, I guess, um, Alexis, I'll just have to hope that what you indicated uh, will, will indeed be the case and we'll cross our fingers about that. But um, I don't see enough that I would not vote in favor of the project. But but I do want to just indicate that that there still are some concerns about it. Thanks, Mr. Mills. Uh, two points that I want to make. One is following up to that. I think that you're right. It's not ideal. I think that in terms of where the um, where the driveway is aligned here. I don't like, no matter what you put there, it's still going to face that same challenge. Like it's not, I don't think it's because of any fault of this particular developer. It's this particular site. Um, and maybe I'm the optimist here, but making that awkward maneuver, if you need to get into town, might get you on your bike um, to go down the hill on Liberty because Liberty is nice to cycle on generally. I mean, at least once you get to make, at least once you get to stadium. Um, and there's also decent bus access. So um, maybe that's just kind of the nudge that people need to get out of their car if they're, if they're going into town in the morning. Again, that's my optimistic sense there. The other point that I wanted to make in part because Alexis talked about how many vehicle spots there actually are here. Forgive me because I wasn't at the last meeting um, if you went over this. When I was reading the staff report, I was surprised that there's significantly more parking than what's required. And knowing that those are tandem garages and so even more cars are allowed, that, like could park there, that seems like a lot. So um, effectively three, it, it seems to me to work out to three cars per unit. And so my question to the petitioner is, do you really need that? Can you defer some of that surface parking? Uh, that is a question I would have to defer to my client as far as operationally, um, how they would feel about that. It's something we can discuss. Um, that's all and I can offer you at this time. I don't know how familiar you are with our deferral, the parking deferral process. You have it shown on your site plan so that you have the space for it and it conforms if you ever need it. But effectively, it's didn't we look this up, Alexis? It's like 40%. Um, so 30%, there's a 30 and a 40 in the code. And I, when I'm on the spot, one of them is um, for compact spaces and one is for deferral, but it's either 30 or 40. Okay. So there's a pretty sizable chunk that effectively like you don't have to build in order to get your all of the certificates of occupancy and things that you need. Um, I would strongly encourage your client to consider that um, because I, I just think that that's a lot. But I mean, generally speaking, we don't encourage people to exceed our parking minimums. You're already exceeding it and that's not when you count the tandem, you know, the, the people who can park two cars in their garage. Um, yeah. And so that just seems like a lot. Yeah, well, definitely have a discussion with them. And I'm sure if that's, um, if that works for them, I'm sure they'd be like to defer the expense of building them as well. So that's something we'll, we'll discuss. Thank you. Further discussion? Commissioner Briggs. Um, since Ms. Ranger is on the line, I would like to hear, sorry, 
would like to hear, you know, uh, maybe her comment a little bit on this um, traffic arrangement. Cynthia, can you hear us? I am back, yes. All right, so uh, go ahead, Commissioner Briggs. Yeah, so thank you so much um, for being here. I was just, um, you know, reading in the report kind of your concern, you know, just kind of the reminder to us that kind of what you would anticipate traffic patterns being if, if people are doing as they're supposed to and, you know, um, and, kind of the maneuvers that they're going to need to make um, if they're if they're trying to try to actually head back into town. And so how do you how do you look at situations like that? How do you determine, you know, whether or not something is creating a, a safety issue or, you know, undue nuisance um, potentially for the community? Well, when we're looking at access, we're usually looking at whether or not the access point itself is safe. And the developer has provided a design that does meet that, that basic standard. In addition to that, you, know, you are looking at whether or not it, it could be problematic. And as this is a multifamily development, which does produce fewer trips than say the same number of units a single family would. You know, you do have have that advantage of having a lower trip demand. And there's there's a potential that uh, residents will notice. I anticipate that people are most likely to take the right and then take the next available right and go around that the median that is that to that median opening and kind of make that u-turn on that on that first neighborhood street which i can't remember off the top of my head but that might not even get you to like a driveway on for for any of those households but and then making a left and coming back in and you know, there will be some delay incurred if you're trying to do that maneuver during a peak hour just because liberty is a little bit busier I think that Commissioner, I believe it was Commissioner Mills who was having the optimistic view that this might encourage alternative transportation modes. It, it's definitely possible. Um, Liberty is one of our very popular bicycle commuting corridors and it's a, it's trade-off, right? It's, that's something to consider. I don't think that there is anything inherently unsafe in allowing this access to go in and allowing that number of trips to get um, pushed off. I can't remember what the, the total daily projected number of trips out there, but um, you know, the PM peak and AM peak trips are not really significant. The number of units originally, I believe, was a little bit higher for this site and they have since reduced those. Alexis can nod yes or no if I got that right, but um yeah okay and then, so this, is, this is just the considerations no that's helpful and you know for me i think i'm also just kind of remembering the the project the medical marijuana dispensary that was on north main street that we turned down um for sort of for similar reasons um mm -hmm. and when you we if you i don't know if you can remember that project or not or you know if that's um do you feel that that was um sort of more more extreme issues in that situation, or I don't, I don't know if they're comparable. Um, yeah, there's definitely a more significant in terms of like the issues. Uh, medical marijuana is a really high trip generator uh, for the square footage that they usually occupy. They they generate a lot of trips. They had, tend to have very high turnover trips, so the no one individual is staying for a long period of time, but they really, and especially if you 
you now have medical and recreational together. That that's a really high trip generator, and some of the other considerations out on on um, Main Street there were that there weren't there weren't a, a lot of side streets available for for people to either route around, you know, or redirect their trip, and you have much higher speeds. Thank you. That's helpful for me. Uh, Ms. Redinger, while, while you're here with us, I, I have one question where it's a travel, um, sort of these uh, traffic reports that we're seeing and um, trips and such. Um, when, and I don't know, maybe Alexis, you can fill, up, fill us in on this, but when was this traffic study done? Um, and the reason why I asked that is going to be, you know, obviously uh, March, April, May, um, even to today, um, the number of trips that we've been seeing in our community are, are substantially reduced uh, compared to non-pandemic times. Um, so I guess the first question is, when was this traffic study done? And I guess the follow-up question after that, if, since you are here with us, um, how, how are we looking at this as we're seeing new projects come uh, about? Um, you know, we have a, a pretty big one coming up at our next meeting on Broadway. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm sorry to sidetrack, but I, I'd like to use your time here just because we don't see you very often. We like seeing you. Well, I'm always happy to be here when you need me. I, John may have his study open and may be able to answer this faster, but I believe the traffic counts for this location were updated in 2019. Correct. Glad my memory is working. <laughs> so this study predated any COVID-19 related travel pattern changes. We do have several um, st projects that are coming in right now that are having to deal with that issue. The things that you'll be seeing in the near future, though, will all have started their process far enough in the past to have traffic have been able to collect transportation counts and those those counts will have occurred pre covid we do have several projects that we are looking at um, accepting their first submissions on that have contacted staff and asked what do you want us to do about traffic and traffic counts for all modes and what we have what we've been recommending is that Right now, we don't know what our new normal will look like. We don't know what our mode split is going to end up at the end of this. And we don't know what our trips will end up being eventually. We don't know how many folks will continue to at least part of the time be working in a remote work scenario. We don't know. We can guess, we can estimate, but we really, we're not going to know. And it's probably going to be two years before we actually start to figure that out. And in the interim, we need to figure out how to allow property owners to, to continue to work toward their project goals. So what we are working with is we're looking at historic counts, data that we already have. Um, and if a project is coming in, we look at anything that we have that's been submitted through the, the planning process that we can use and apply traffic data for. We are fortunate in that we have a signal retiming project that's going on where we have a lot of intersections across the city that we are looking at signal timing for and signal retiming for several corridors and some individual intersections throughout the city. So we have sample counts at a lot of locations right now which is good because then you can take historic data and you can compare that to, to those more recent counts and look also get information from Watts as far as what their model is predicting for growth and be able to come up with a reasonable estimate of what traffic counts could look like. And we move from there. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Mills, thank you, no? Further discussion? Seeing none, I think we're ready for a vote. Uh, Mr. Leonard, will you please do a roll call vote? 
Yes. Commissioner Briggs. Yes. Commissioner Mills. Yes. Commissioner Milstein. Yes. Commissioner Gibrandle. Yes. Commissioner Ackerman. Yes. Commissioner Sobe. Yes. Commissioner Abrams. Yes. Can you hear me now? Commissioner Hammerschmidt. Yes. Commissioner Woods. Yes. All yeses carries unanimously. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Moving on to the next item on our agenda, which is Valhalla Ann Arbor site plan annexation and rezoning for city council approval. I'll give Mr. Leonard a minute or two to uh, switch out our attendees. Project gets the award for the most project representatives. If if there is an award, I'm pretty sure after uh, we're uh, through Zoom uh, planning commission meetings, maybe we can have an award show. I like it. You know, I think that line item got cut from the budget because of the COVID revenue. I think we'll, that we'll call it the. The plannies, the plannies. <laughs> All right, is that everyone, Mr. Leonard? I believe so. Unless uh, petitioners, you are responsible for your own video and muting. Um, Mr. Moore, I presume that you're going to kick things off. Am I unmuted? Yes, you are. I don't sure why the camera's not working, but uh, I could either fiddle with the technology or I could start. Um, so let me just go ahead. Oh, there it is. Um, uh, uh, you have, should have before you the revised uh, submittal. Mr. Um, Moore, you're going through and make yeah, some your your audio. audio. Yeah. Your audio, something's going on with your microphone. You're cutting in and out. I don't know how to change that. I'm connected with the hard line unless I log out and reload. Yeah, my the video, sometimes it helps your sound quality. That may be another option. Stop it. All right, I've stopped the, the video. Does that improve the audio? No, I think the best thing would be to leave the meeting and then come back in. Or to try computer audio as opposed to. We'll do that. I like these plannies though. I feel like this is a, a good thing to embed in our culture. I will get to work on designing certificates for it. What are we we also get the award for three brads on the development team. Oh, wow, most brads. 
Right yeah, we got to come up with some good categories. Fastest approval. Yeah, what are we trying to incentivize? <laughs> <I don't know>. <laughs> <laughs> Longest meeting is not an award. <laughs> no. Most detailed site plan. <laughs> Most colorful elevations. Still waiting for Mr. Moore to pop back up here. Shannon, what kind of plants do you want to see more of in Ann Arbor? We could do who, whoever recommends planting the most of that species. I don't know. If I could wave my wand, this doesn't really work that way. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> Petitioners, is there anybody else that you would like to present or you want to give it a few more moments for Mr. Moore? This is Brad Strider. I was going to go second and maybe I could go first while we wait for Brad Moore to join. How about that? Would that work? That's perfect. All right. Uh, I'm Brad Strader, the first of three Brads speaking tonight. I'm a planner with MKSK and uh, joined you last month when I had technical difficulties. So thanks again for having us on the agenda and giving us a, a chance to speak. Uh, my role tonight was since we had the last planning commission meeting, the team went back and listened to all the comments. We made a lot of changes to the plans, which we've listed in our letter dated uh, June 24th, and Brad Moore was gonna go through some of those changes. One of the things we felt based on the discussion last month was to articulate uh, the, the many benefits that we feel the project is providing, especially in contrast with the single family development that exists now or could exist in, in the future, depending on how you interpret the master plan. And I thought we had a really good dialogue last month about how our proposed development is consistent with the trends in the area and so forth. And, and I thank your uh, reception to that and the good discussion you had. We did provide a list of the benefits in detail on our June 24th letter, but I just wanted to summarize, I think, some of the highlights of that. And many of these benefits I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be talking about are benefits to the city or benefits that are consistent with city policies and master plan policies and so forth, not things that benefit the development or the residents to the development. We think there are a lot of amenities that will benefit the residents. Um, again, you can refer to our, our full list, but one is meeting the needs for more multiple family in the city of Ann Arbor at an appropriate location that's on a major thoroughfare next to open space in the golf course. So it's not as incompatible um, with other locations that the city has debated for years about providing that need for multiple family. Uh, you'll hear more tonight from the third Brad speaking about the affordable units that based on some of the discussion we've had from the planning commission and staff to raise the number of affordable units to 15 and uh, modifying the AMI and so forth as, as he'll discuss and was in our materials. We've re we will be replacing the energy inefficient single family that's on individual septics, not very environmentally friendly, with a modern, fully designed, unified uh, development with modern stormwater. Um, we touted last month, and you had a lot of discussion about it, the many sustainable features that we have, and Eric Doyle will talk a little bit more about that tonight, uh, but just to hit the highlights, we've now gone all electric per your request, uh, including electric charging stations and all electric appliances and so forth. We've got renewable energy with the solar panels. We've got green roofs. We're designing toward lead silver, underground parking. Um, we've got a location that supports options to single occupant vehicles and really supports alternative transportation and all those other features to reduce our carbon footprint and consistent with the planning commission discussion and um, city policy. This location is within walking distance of grocery stores and stop, uh, shops and stores and restaurants and services, which we think is another benefit and a way that people can uh, get around without driving. This site places density along a AAA or the ride corridor within also convenient distance of a number of transportation options that U of M offers. So again, alternatives to driving single occupant vehicles. Uh, we even have car share parking as part of the project. And the one thing we didn't talk about last month, but we talked about as a team is also the fiscal benefits to the city. We have a lot of things that are internal uh, in contrast with single family that's often viewed as sort of a financial drain on a city. Right now the city gets no tax base because it's in Pittsfield Township, but we're looking at an investment of 125 to 130 million. So it'd be a significant tax generator, a benefit to the city compared to uh, nothing now. So those are some of the benefits we wanted you to think about as you look at this conditional rezoning um, in your consideration tonight and hopefully Brad now has better audio. Hopefully Brad has audio. 
and more right, there. Back to you. Uh, I'm not hearing you guys real well. I don't know if you're hearing me any better. No, Brad, do you want to try calling? Brad, do you want to try calling in just via phone? Do you have the meeting yeah, information? I, I, if if not, I can share it with you. Yeah, I got it. Okay, go ahead and call okay. in, and we'll, and we'll just patch you in via phone. See if the audio is better. Have Eric uh, do his part portion of the presentation. I was going to suggest that we, uh, Eric Doyle can just hit the highlights of some of the changes we made for energy efficiency. Eric, do you want to take over till we get Brad back? Absolutely. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Fantastic. So as mentioned, the major shift in design that we had was to pursue electrification on the project. So that means there will be no use of natural gas with the exception of potential fuel for emergency generators, which is very common. By substituting that natural gas use for electric power, we feel that the project better aligns with Ann Arbor's aggressive carbon neutrality goals, and we hope that you agree. Electrifying the project involves switching our secondary heating source of the VRF systems from a natural gas boiler to an electric boiler, as well as switching all of our domestic hot water systems or DHW. Those heating sources will go from electric or go to electric for both the common areas and for in unit appliances as well. So full electrification of the building. <clears throat> what that results in is an energy savings of the project of about 3.7%, but it does result in an increased operating cost for the entire project of about 12.5%, just because of the difference in cost for electricity over natural gas. The positive piece of this is electrifying the project reduces the overall carbon emissions by 10% annually. So it's a huge, huge impact by going to electrification. Since eliminating natural gas increased the electrical energy consumption of the project though, the percentage of the total energy offset by our current solar array was reduced to approximately 13% of the total electric load, just because of that additional electric cost that was shifted from the, the natural gas use. So as it relates to the commitment to designing towards lead silver, the buildings will be designed to demonstrate an 8% energy efficiency improvement over the current lead baseline. We're still very early in the design process of this and the project may analyze some other ECMs or energy cost saving measures uh, in future design phases, such as improvements in the envelope, decreased air infiltration, improved ERV performance, uh, installing energy star appliances, higher efficiency domestic hot water systems, things like that, uh, increased parking ventilation. So that would come later on in the design process to try and meet that 8% energy, energy efficiency improvement current to the, the lead baseline. Thank you. I think we have Mr. Moore on the line. Yeah, let's see if this technology works. We can hear you clearly now, so go, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, uh, so one of the other things that was brought up <clears throat> was the building heights. And we wanted to clarify that the maximum building height limitation that we'd referred to previously um, only applied to a measurement from the very lowest point of the site uh, down <clears throat> on the north end of the site um, to the highest roof surface of the buildings on the south uh, part of the site that no individual building is, is seven stories um, so we also have tied our conditions to the average billing height, uh, which has been shown on the site plan for each building. I know there was some confusion about whether the building in the southwest corner was four or five stories, and we had originally proposed five there, and that's what we presented at the citizens participation meeting, but it was clear that people thought that five stories was a bridge too far. So we shortened that building to four stories, and that is reflected in the uh, average building height table that was submitted as part of the site plan uh, submittal. So we clarified uh, how that building height uh, is going to be applied to each individual building on the project. Um, and uh, I think uh, one of the other brands may have also mentioned that we have uh, or changed the affordability component so that all of, all of the units now are going to be available to people at the 60% uh, AMI uh, level uh, rather than the previous uh, proposal. 
And uh, I think um, Brad McFarland will be able to speak a little bit on the affordability component and the financial impacts that has on the project. Yeah, for sure. For sure. The uh, <clears throat> from an affordable housing standpoint, I lifted this project project up, down, and sideways uh, in order to try and uh, help toward the city's affordable housing goal. Um, and then, like Brad Moore just said, in response to the comments from the last planning commission, we have 15 affordable units at 60 percent of 60 uh, percent AMI threshold. Um, the reality is those 15 units uh, equate to an annual revenue revenue loss for ownership somewhere between the $250,000 and $300,000 uh, mark, somewhere in that range, um, which is significant. Um, and <clears throat> I just bring this to your attention because as a result, the project simply isn't economically viable with any more affordable housing units. So what we're pro pro proposing here with the 15 units at the 60% AMI is truly our, our best foot forward. And just one last thing, Brad Streeter again, um, we have Julie Crow from Fleece and Vanderbrink, the traffic engineer, because the commission did ask last month about the access and design, and we did put it in our letter dated June 24th. Uh, but Julie's worked with, uh, maybe Cynthia, if she's still on, but worked with the engineering department. And there are a couple of options to improve the situation there and improve safety and operations. And those details would be agreed upon between the developer and the city engineering department as it goes through the, the public review process. But we did um, have information in our traffic impact study sketches and ideas and have had discussions with city engineering. So we think that problem is resolved. We just didn't get a chance to show you the uh, the ideas in the meeting last month. So we did put that in our letter and Julie is here if you need anything more specific. Great, thank you. Um, we'll now head to Mr. Kowalski for uh, a staff report. Okay, there we go. Hi. Good evening, everybody. Um, I see you all again. Um, I, I don't think I'll give a brief back I don't think I'll give a background on the report or on projects per se right now. I, I assume we all know what we're talking about given the developer's um, intro just now. So what I will do is just touch on a couple of the highlights that we've seen um, working with developer over the last couple of weeks or so. Um, so most of which they've really already covered in that the, um, uh, the all electric, which was something that was uh, requested specifically by the planning commission, obviously that was addressed. Uh, affordable housing, a concern of planning commission as well as uh, staff. Um, that number has gone up, as you just heard. Um, the revised, they also had done, I believe, some reconfiguration with the solar uh, to maximize the efficiency of that on the rooftop areas. We did have a communication from our sustainability manager, who I, I believe that communication should have been forwarded to you. Um, so I did meet with her in order to go through the items that they were proposing here and get some additional feedback on that. So um, you do have that comment, those comments as well. So really, is, and there has been no changes to the site plan itself. Um, Mr. Moore briefly touched on the revision to the height, which again was not a revision to the plan per se. We did just go back and confirm. Uh, I, staff does agree with their analysis that the height did go down a couple of feet. But, but there's been no physical changes to the actual site plan since you all have seen it about a month ago. Um, so really that covers my uh, brief and short staff report and summary at this time. And of course I'm available to answer any questions. We also have uh, Cynthia Redinger available to answer any traffic questions that may come up as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at this time I'd like to open up the public hearing on this item. This is an opportunity for persons to speak for up to three minutes about a proposed annexation, rezoning, and or site plan for the Valhalla petition. Public comment may be made by calling 877-853-5247 and then entering meeting ID 926-3370-3308. This information is also displayed on the meeting agenda and video feed. City staff will select callers that have raised their hand one by one using the last three digits of your phone number. In order to electronically raise your hand after dialing into the meeting, please press star nine on your phone. You'll hear an automated announcement once the host is allowing you to speak. When speaking, please move to a quiet area and mute any television or background sounds so that we may hear you clearly. Please state your name and address for the record at the beginning of your comments.
do have a couple callers on the line. Um, given that we had one caller that was having difficulty with the star nine function, would you like me to just invite the callers to uh, uh, proactively ask them if they would like to comment? Sure. Well, caller uh, ending with uh, phone number ending with 404, would you like to speak during the public hearing on the Valhalla petition? There is a no. Hello, caller with phone number ending in numbers 134. You have three minutes to address the Planning Commission on the Valhalla petition. Um, thank you, Mr. Leonard, and um, thank you, Chair Milstein. This is Ken Garber. I live at 28 Haverhill Court. Um, thank you for holding this public hearing. I'll be talking strictly about the sustainability elements of the plan. I'm thrilled that the petitioner has gone all electric. This is fantastic. Uh, my only question is, why isn't this true of all new construction in this apocalyptic year 2020 at this late stage of the climate crisis? Um, maybe the commission can ask the petitioner for some insight into this question. Specifically, does putting in a VRF system as opposed to natural gas heating with air conditioning add or subtract construction costs? Uh, the answer could help inform future discussions with developers. My, my one real question is about solar panels. The previous plan included 435,000 kilowatt hours photovoltaic capacity annually, um, which I think was to provide 12 to 13% of the project's electricity needs. Um, I don't see in today's staff report that they're adding any more solar panels. I may have missed it or in the discussion, I apologize if so. Um, with all electric heating and appliances, electricity use will go up. Mr. Doyle said that solar will still cover 13%, so maybe they've added more rooftop solar. Um, but if not, the original plan specified about 10,000 square feet of vegetated roof area. Green roofs are great, they help cool buildings in summer, and they slow stormwater runoff. But solar panels would have a bigger overall energy impact. Roughly 568 panels, each putting out 265 watts of power, could fill that same area. That comes to 150 kilowatts, which over the course of a year, assuming the Michigan average of 4.1 hours of peak sunlight per day, would provide 224,000 kilowatt hours of energy, thus increasing the project's current generating capacity by 52%. At least that's my back of the napkin calculation. This will add costs, but relatively little compared to the overall cost of the project. And it may be possible to retain some of the green roofs while installing more solar panels on available bare roof. Although 820 envisions electricity powered by 100% renewable energy by 2030, that is not guaranteed. And anyway, on-site electricity generation is better because transmission losses are eliminated. And the more we can generate locally, especially on-site, the less we'll have to buy from outside vendors. 25 seconds, Mr. Garber. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garber. I think we have another hand raised, maybe. Hello. Hello, caller with phone number ending in 197. You have three minutes to address the Planning Commission on the Valhalla petition. Thank you. Um, my name is Taylor Bond. I'm the owner of 2100 South Main, which is the office building at the corner of South Main and Ann Arbor Saline Road. We are adjacent to the Valhalla property and across the street from the uh, uh, University of Michigan driving range. Um, I want to start off by saying that we do favor the project. We favor development. Um, however, we are very concerned about the traffic uh, issues um, that, that will be created by this 450-plus uh, unit um, uh, uh, project. Um, I did see at one point in time a, uh, a traffic study that indicated that the, the traffic would be, I think it was described as not consequential which of course we do not agree with at all. Uh, currently there's very little traffic uh, coming out of there between our office building and then the, uh, the single family homes that are on Valhalla. Um, I wanna mention, we also run a business called Park and Party 
And the reason I mention that is because we are experts in parking and traffic ourselves. Uh, it's, uh, it's, we are a national company, and we uh, deal with huge events uh, in addition to University of Michigan football, things like the Indianapolis 500 and others around the country. So we understand uh, parking and traffic and logistics. Um, our estimates are that uh, if once fully uh, you know, once the unit, the project is full, we're looking at a, at a minimum somewhere between 900 to 1,200 in and outs, you know, cars in and out per day out of that unit um, from tenants. Uh, and that's not counting, you know, Amazon, UPS, FedEx, you know, pizza deliveries, guests, staff, maintenance. Um, and our driveway, um, which is off South Main, just cannot support that kind of traffic. Um, that's, uh, um, that's pretty much the equivalent of about five football games per day. Uh, 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 moving through that area. Um, currently, the the driveway that services our uh, our office building um, and the and the uh, driving range, um, uh, we allow parking on both sides of the street, and uh, um, essentially it's a one lane um, a one lane uh, uh, road there um, uh, passage. Um, everything that anybody wants coming out of that uh, project is pretty much to the left. Uh, that's the Bush's Shopping Center, Briarwood Mall, the highway. Everything is to the left, and, which means that a lot of that traffic is going to uh, somehow try and be pushed down this very small um, um, uh, um, driveway. Um, 30 more seconds, Saturdays, Mr. Bond. Okay. Um, uh, essentially, essentially the, uh, our big concern is, is that uh, – um, uh, you just cannot support the kind of traffic that this project is, gonna, is going to uh, uh, have. Uh, the left-hand turn coming off of South Main is a very difficult one. It crosses two lanes of traffic, and it's, not, uh, uh, it's obtuse. And uh, um, uh, we're concerned, again, by the traffic. The project itself we support, but the, uh, but the traffic is a, is a major concern for us. Thank you, Mr. Bond. Um, Thank Oh, uh, caller with phone number ending with the number 711. You have three minutes to address the Planning Commission. Essentially, essentially the, uh, our big concern is that oh. uh, uh, you just... Hello, thank you. Uh, caller? My name is... Hello? Go ahead. You have three minutes to address the Planning Commission on the Valhalla petition. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Kirsten Ingrid Alt. I live at 2531 Mead Court. I'm calling in support of this project. I will make it brief and short. Um, we all know that about 80,000 people commute into the city every uh, day. Um, maybe that's less now due to the pandemic, but um, someday that will return and uh, at some point, um, hopefully. Anyway, um, if this project is built, that should hope to um, alleviate uh, that uh, situation because maybe some of those people will choose to move into these units. Um, I, want, I, I just want to address three points about this because um, not all of what I'm going to say has already been discussed. One of the things that I really like about this is that there's a diversity of housing types offered, which I think uh, makes this project particularly interesting with the mid-rise towers and the courtyards and the townhouses. So. There's choices for different lifestyles. I really like that. The other thing that I think is really important to address is that we've got 15 affordable housing units that they, that they raise that. Um, that is something that is so critical um, to uh, what's going on in this community. So I think that's really important. And the other thing I really like is the walkability component of this particular project, that it's sited near services, retail, grocery stores, restaurants, and that which has already been discussed, and that it's near bus line and um, I think that that's also really important because that meets um, our sustainability goals. And that's it. I just really wanted to call in support of this. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Are there any other callers who wish to address the Planning Commission? If you can please press star nine so that we may um, bring you up to speak to us. See no more callers. All right. All right. Um, at this time, I'd like to close the public hearing. And without objection, I will read the three motions and we'll take all three of them together. All right. Motion number one, the Ann Arbor City Planning Commission hereby recommends that the Mayor and City Council approve the annexation 
in the Valhalla Ann Arbor rezoning petition to R4E multiple family uh, district based on the proposed zoning and accept these conditions. Uh, number one, the maximum density is not to exceed 50 units per acre. Number two, the maximum height of any building will be 74 feet. Number three, the inclusion of 15 affordable housing units as described in statement of conditions. And number four, the entire project will be serviced only by electricity and not connected to natural gas services. The approval is subject to executing an additional zoning statement of conditions. Uh, motion number two, um, I'm sorry, there's actually just two motions. Uh, motion number two, the Ann Arbor City Planning Commission hereby recommends that the mayor and city council approve Valhalla site plan and development agreement. Do you have a commissioner that will move those two? Uh, moved by Commissioner Wood, seconded by Commissioner Sauve, and we are in discussion starting with Commissioner Ackerman, followed by Commissioner Hammerschmidt. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you to, to the developer for a, a very responsive um, return plan. Uh, really grateful. It looks like you all worked really quickly to, to change some things in the development agreement and the plans. Um, and thanks to staff for, for helping navigate them through that. It, it seems responsive item by item. Um, I want to start uh, first by thanking you for the changes in affordable housing. Um, that was a ask that I know multiple commissioners made, and it was great to see you uh, able to achieve that, um, even at a loss of, of you know, a quarter million dollars a year um, in revenue. Um, so thank you. Um, I had a few questions around energy and carbon. Uh, one, um, a couple uh, around height in the building um, and building B in particular. And then uh, with your neighbor making comments around uh, traffic, I, I want to have a, a couple questions about that. So I'll just try to, to go in order um, and keep my turn brief because I know others likely have questions too. Um, uh, I was curious, I think Mr. Garber raised a really great question, uh, and it would be helpful for our own education, but what was the transition to electricity's impact on your pro forma? What did that calculation look like to you all on paper? I can't, I can't really answer that off the top of my head. I got to circle back with the, you know, the guy, the number crunchers, the team. So sorry, I can't address it right now. If, if you wouldn't mind following up with our staff, that would be hugely impactful um, in how we negotiate one on one projects, but also how we, you know, steer the policy direction of the city that could be majorly impactful for our community. So that'd be super helpful if you would. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, the, the next was uh, Mr. Garber also raised a question around the green roof over solar. And I think we discussed this at our last in our last conversation, but I wanted to revisit it. Would you mind re refreshing what the decision was to include the green roof over increased solar? Yeah, um, can you hear me? Yep. All right, so um, the green roof is located in portions of the project where there are habitable space one story above that roof surface. These buildings uh, step down with the contours or the terrain, the topography. And so the, the lower uh, rooftops that are overlooked by people's residences or other habitable space, um, it was felt would be better served looking at a green roof than the back uh, of all of the mechanical equipment that the solar array would um, put in their view. So that <clears throat> the green roof, aside from its other benefits of attracting pollinators and reducing energy costs and uh, filtering stormwater and all the, the other benefits that um, Commissioner Gibbs Randall is often expended on for uh, green roofs. Um, it was principally uh, to preserve the desirability of the upper units uh, and not look out at a, a mechanical equipment uh, uh, farm on those rooftop areas. This is Eric Doyle. I, I just wanted to add to that too, that that provides the human element to this. We see this very often in hospital applications where they put green roofs over areas that patients can look over. It helps with recovery times, and that translates to the people that live in, in those apartments too, of having that, that nicer view and the, the wellness component of it. Okay, I can certainly understand that, I think. And I, I see the value in that both to your tenants uh, and also your ability to lease those units out. 
for more. Um, I'm curious if other colleagues have thoughts on those trade-offs, but I definitely understand the logic. Um, excellent. Um, moving to the height uh, of building B in particular, in your letter to us, you mentioned um, a reduction from five stories to four stories. And I'm trying to remember the site plans that you showed us um, at our last meeting had that already been reduced to four stories or is this an additional reduction of a floor? No, it was, uh, it was already four stories uh, last okay. time. Um, yeah, there's, a, there's actually a rendered view of that south uh, corner. Um, <clears throat> I believe in the current PDF, Matt or Brett, it was uh, slide, I think it's slide 20. Let me just double check that. Yeah, slide 20 um, is, a, is a view looking at that southeast corner of that building. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure what's on the screen right now. That looks like it's a different slide number. Uh, which, uh, is this the current PDF or the old PDF? That's the current PDF. Keep going, keep going. Now it's back a ways. Um, it looks like the order of the PDFs got jumbled somehow. Keep going. There you go. Oop. There you go. So that's that's the southeast corner. You can clearly see it's a four-story building. Yeah. So I mean. I by no means am I intimidated by that. I think I also, I brought this up to uh, the building B in particular um, at, at our last meeting and the idea of, of trying to, to meet some, some neighbors to your south, their concerns about the massing um, uh, of this, this exposure. Um, you know, looking at this elevation it's, and the distance from that you are to the neighbor and the, the green space they have between, you know, I'm reassured by this visual. Um, can you remind us of what buffer exists? What's the landscape buffer? You, you have some uh, you know, drawings of foliage there, but what you see in elevations isn't always what's on the plan. Yeah, we, when we built this 3D model, we actually used the okay. landscape plan that uh, uh, Atwell Hicks has submitted as part of the uh, site plan uh, okay. submittal. Some of, the, some of the foliage uh, is actually on the university side of the property line. Okay, I'll revisit the site plan when I'm, I'm done with my final questions, um, but thank you for that. Um, and the added context that there was a reduced story from that building prior to my request. Um, it sounds like your response earlier in the process. Um, I think when it, it comes to the traffic safety elements and the turning movements, especially with respect to the median, I know that caused a lot of pause for, for some colleagues, uh, myself included. Um, and it, the, the three bullet points you articulated in your letter back to us, I, I think make good sense. It would be helpful to, to visualize those at some point. Um, I, I think that's something that uh, I had, I had flagged as a visual aid would be helpful. And I think certainly if this goes to the, or when this goes to the city council table with our recommendation or not, um, you know, it would be, uh, I think that visual would be, be helpful um, for your audience. Um, and, uh, but I also had some questions around process. I think there was a little bit of, of heartburn and concern about we would be approving this uh, plan without the, I guess the reassurance or, or the really understanding that what these these improvements would be um, to keep these turning motion movements safe and kind of manage the medium. Um, and I'm wondering if, if any of that process has been clarified um, in, in the inter, intermittent weeks. Um, I, I know that uh, our traffic engineer has, has worked close, closely with the city traffic engineer. Um, maybe the maybe the city uh, traffic engineer can talk a little bit more about the process. I know um, our engineer uh, worked with uh, Atwell to come up with several ideas 
that were workable solutions. Uh, it's just that there's a public engagement process, but maybe um, Ms. Redinger can speak to that. Um, I apologize. I don't have the, the, the language that we put together for the development agreement in front of me, but in that development agreement, we specify, um, the process that, that we'll be taking, which is, you know, we'll take some of the, the engineering options that get developed collaboratively between the, the development team and the, their transportation engineer and our staff and have them run a process with the property owner specifically on the opposite side of the street are going to be most impacted by changes to the access point to allow them um, to have some input into the process and, and collaboratively develop a, a design solution that's going to work best. Um, I, okay, I'll, I'll look back to the development agreement with an eye for that um, as well um, when, I'm, when I'm done. So that's great. Um, and thanks for pointing me there. That's not where I was going. Um, okay, and then my last question was around, you know, the only neighbor who really raised any concerns tonight was a business owner to the south um, and had concerns around traffic. I know that this body really tried to encourage you to, to you know, for some parking, it, the biggest driver you're going to have of traffic is the number of cars that you have on site, and that's going to be decided by the amount of parking you have. Um, it seemed like in your letter, you're pretty adamant that there was no room to budge on that. Um, and I, you know, but I wanted to raise it too, in case there were um, any creative ways that we can try to get around that, maybe increase ride share um, uh, as a as an option, um, for example. So just wanted to flag that one again, because I think the, you know, if, if this, if your neighbor's comments are any indication of other neighbor's sentiments, uh, you know, I think removing some parking would have the added benefit of reducing your carbon emissions more and also alleviating concerns from the neighbors. And that's it for me, for this round. Commissioner Hammerschmidt, I think you were next. Thank you. That's a perfect segue because I wanted to understand a little bit more, um, I guess, like from the lender's perspective, why they're saying that it's not possible to reduce parking since you are uh, proposing more parking than we require. And then I was a little bit confused too about the, and maybe Mr. Kowalski can help with this, the creating the language that could allow for the deferment, but it wasn't consistent with city code and could not be accepted. And if there's still any opportunity there to create language that is consistent. Well, I, I can comment a little bit, but then I will, I'll have to defer, obviously, yep. to the developer's team regarding um, why they couldn't reduce it. Um, just to clarify my comments, uh, no, they, they, they can reduce the parking. I mean, I think there, you are allowed to defer up to 40% below the, from the required. So um, that, that is permitted by code. I think there, I forget which exactly, Method. There's one method that I, I know I've been working, consulting with the developer and the representatives to try and they were kind of trying to come up with some creative ways to maybe that the parking could be removed later. And there were some ways that were not compliant with code. I can't remember specifically which example that I that you're speaking to, but I know that it is possible through code, <clears throat> excuse me, to defer parking. So you can go lower. I don't think our code is the issue at this time. <clears throat> right. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I guess well, my. If, if I could just interject quickly, I think um, one of the challenges for deferred parking when it's part of a required minimum is that I think that there's a risk presumed by the petitioner that at some point the city is going to come in and require that parking to be put in. And so that adds a bit of an unknown. But in this circumstance, I don't know that that should be, I don't perceive that to be the most pressing concern because they're, they're above that parking threshold. I think to some extent that still adds an unknown, like if from a finance pro forma perspective, 
you probably want to know when your capital improvements have reached some form of conclusion. And whenever you have some sort of level of deferred parking, that unknown exists. Um, nonetheless, that application is a little bit muddier here because they are over that minimum. So I just wanted to add that, that lens to it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, my clients have indicated that if they can find an underwriter to finance the project with less parking than we currently have, <clears throat> they're willing to do it. Our hope was to be able to reduce the amount of structured parking because that's the most expensive uh, to build um, without having to go back to um, city council for a revision of the site plan so that the uh, reduction of the parking could be handled administratively. Um, you know, we're not opposed to reducing the parking as long as it doesn't interfere with our ability to finance the project. Where did Commissioner Hammersman go? I think she dropped off and you just need to promote her, Brett. You know, also, also, Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'll also point out that we have, um, you know, EV charging stations uh, in, in the, in the, both of the two uh, uh, structured parking areas. Um, I think we've got 12 in each of the two buildings for a total of 24 and the system is going to be designed so that the number of the EV uh, vehicles can be expanded with the demand on the site. So, um, I just, uh, I don't, I don't want to have everybody think that just because the parking spaces are there, they're ne necessarily going to be com internal combustion type of vehicles. So I heard most of the response. Sorry, as soon as Mr. Leonard started talking, my internet just decided to quit on me. Um, so Mr. Moore, you were saying that the parking that you were going to try to reduce was the structured parking. Yes, yeah, so that would be the, that would be the choice of the uh, parking to reduce because it's the uh, most yeah. expensive yeah. to provide the, the, is, the lender is not is it I'm, I'm just trying to understand like from the the financing perspective is like the lender yeah, so, is not on board with that yeah, so the underwriters are the ones that are, are driving the parking requirements from a financing standpoint um, if we take it down to the minimum parking we can't we it's difficult to find anybody especially in this day and age to underwrite the project if we and I was what I was saying is if we do find somebody that is willing to underwrite the project with a lower parking ratio, we we want to be able to accomplish that task. Um, and and what, I, what we were trying to do with staff is be able to accomplish that reduction in the structured parking um, through an administrative amendment process rather than the more lengthy and involved process of going through a, a new site plan approval, um, you know, through a full council hearing. Okay, I'm just, I guess I'm just surprised that uh, you're exceeding like the city minimums that are they're exceeding what we're what is what we are requiring. I'm just surprised that the lender would still require you to well, bid yeah. more so, spaces. So the national lenders aren't, aren't particularly um, keen on or, or they don't care necessarily what the city requirements are. They're looking at pro formas of a, a national leasing rates in a lot of different communities. So it's not uncommon for us to struggle with this uh, and say restaurant or uh, mixed use projects uh, because the lenders um, are working on, on financing projects all over the country. So they're not looking at what the uh, required minimums are. They're looking at what they believe are industry necessities. And I'll just comment that I'm really hoping that that's changing. Mike, some colleagues at my day job have been doing a lot of research on parking and are about to launch a survey to lenders to really get their understanding, a national survey, I think, to see, you know, what what is the appetite out there for being able to reduce parking standards. So hopefully in the future, this won't be an issue and you won't have to build all of that expensive parking. Yeah, it's been my experience that the lenders are the most conservative and the last to change their minds. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, Okay, thank you. That's helpful. I, since I heard about 80% of that. Um, I'll also just say, I think I said this at the last meeting, but I think this is a great project in a great location. Um, we got a lot of positive su in support comments, um, which is really nice to see. So I'm very excited about this moving forward. Commissioner Mills. 
Thanks. Um, I also am super supportive of this and excited to see it. I have some more detailed questions about two of the sustainability aspects of this. Um, more to pick your brain because as um, one of the callers said before and what we got in some of the letters, um, we want to know why we're not seeing more of this. And so to help us better understand. So I want to talk first about all electric and then um, I don't know if you're aware, but the item after this is talking about our e our parking and EVs within or EV charging within parking. And so I want to pick your brains on that as well. Um, so the the caller mentioned in kind of one of the questions that I had is there's this sense that electrifying space conditioning can be tricky um, in a climate such as Michigan, but you did it. <laughs> um, how uh, and so effectively like. Why is it possible in your design and we're not seeing more of this? Um, I, don't, I don't know who wants to take the lead on that, um, Eric. You, you might have some insights. Um, uh, and I, I, can't, I can't speak to what other people are doing. I, I know that um, it is uh, often less expensive when you look at um, you know, for forecasts on, on energy consumption when you look at the, the natural gas prices. Um, I know there are also concerns in some developments about the availability of, of the local utility to supply the level of electricity with the current infrastructure. Um, and, and oftentimes, again, it's going to vary by location. Um, if a developer is looking to do an all electric uh, building or project, and the local utility just doesn't have the infrastructure to bring that much electricity to the site, uh, it could be cost prohibitive because then the developer is stuck with having to upgrade the utility's infrastructure at his dime. Yeah, so this is this is Eric. I, I will have a hard time answering the first question of why we're not seeing more of this. And I guess I will take some of that personal responsibility and blame for this. I've been in this industry for sustainability for 16 years. And I guess maybe I haven't been doing my job well enough. Uh, we've, we've been promoting electrification of projects for the last decade. And I will say in the last year or so, we've seen a lot of movement and a lot of progress. Some of that has come from the utility companies and promoting different incentive programs that tie in with electrification. So having those added incentives are going to get us there. As, as far as electrifying the space conditioning within our climate, I think mm -hmm. a lot of technology improvements have, have come about. We did some all electric projects eight, seven, eight years ago. They were renovation projects. And so they didn't have proper uh, insulation in walls and they really struggled. But with technology improvements and with better insulation, better code requirements for insulation of the buildings, it's a lot more practical now. So I hope that I answered your questions. So designing that from the beginning, being able to design an efficient building along with electric heating and cooling is one of the reasons that it's possible here is what I'm hearing. Yeah, we, we always focus on efficiency first. Great. And it sounds like at least one of your final comments in your kind of portion of this was that you may even need to do more, like in order to get the lead silver points. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, as as we've stated that we're committing to de designing to the lead silver standard, which requires, I believe, three points and 8% improvement. So that that is reflected in this with a Got variety it. of different different components to that. Just a little bit more nitty gritties. You mentioned and uh, to there was the question on the call, which I think is a good one about um, upfront cost. How does uh, the uh, equipment, you know, the VRF or whatever it is for um, electric heating and cooling compared to natural gas equipment, those initial installation or, you know, upfront costs. I cannot address that. We, we looked at it from an energy modeling perspective, not from a cost of construction perspective. Uh, so I, I can't answer that question. Does the architect or anybody else know about that part? You know, we've heard we've heard varying estimates, but uh, I, I, when we we've done preliminary pricing, I've, it's always uh, been the case uh, that the uh, the natural gas uh, option comes in 
you know, at least 20, if not 30% less expensive uh, in the upfront cost. Okay. Um, there may be uh, longer term issues with, um, you know, cost of operation, but usually when you're trying to get something built, um, it's very common to focus on the, on the initial cost. And, and just to make sure that I under, I heard this correctly, um, uh, in your presentation, Mr. Doyle, I think you also said that over that there's longer, there's greater operational costs, that it's going to increase operational costs. So um, presumably that's based on current, is it, do you know if that's based on current price of natural gas versus electricity or is it projecting, you know, cost we, increases of natural gas in the future? Our energy model uh, used the state averages for gas and electric on it. So that will vary depending on the, the site and the types of deals that you get with the local utilities. But that, that information is accurate as of within the last couple of years. And as, as we've seen in, in the last eight years or so, the cost of natural gas has is, is come down considerably. So that has an impact on it. But like I said, switching to all electric had a very significant impact in carbon reduction. Exactly. I was going to say it's fracking, right? That's that's among the reasons that the cost of natural gas has stayed low, but there's uncertainty in that in the future. So um, there can be benefits over the long haul. But thanks for letting us know and running those calculations of what it means on your project for right now. I think that that's helpful in putting it in context. Um, Let's see. The other, the so you addressed, um, Commissioner Ackerman asked before about the green roof versus solar, and so I appreciate that. One of the, one of the questions that I had, given that your load now is so much higher, your electric load is so much higher, um, I know one of the concerns uh, is, when you're thinking about putting solar panels on your roof is that um, particularly in the net metering regime that we currently have, um, when you have excess power that you have to sell back to the grid, you're losing some of the, you know, some of the economic benefit there. Um, because you have such a high electricity load, I'm curious if, like, even in your, even in the time when those solar panels are creating the most power, are you actually needing to draw anything from the grid or is there still space and would there be an opportunity for example for solar carports to effectively take advantage because those panels that where you where you're not pushing excess power to the grid are going to pay for themselves faster um I mean, there is again a higher upfront cost but i'm just curious if you considered that at all um uh. I don't have the numbers in front of me as far as like the, the physical offset of it, but just based on, on the estimates that we have, I don't, I don't think that the building would be overproducing at any point uh, during the summer on a given day where you would be able to do that. And you, you would have to add a considerable amount of solar to be able to get to that point. I know you, most of your parking is underground but it, I think there is still some surface parking on, you know, on the paths. And I would just suggest that that would be a lovely way to supplement. Um, uh, so I don't know, again, I'm not, I don't do lead. So I don't know all of the ways that you can kind of earn your points towards that, but I would just, my guess too is that you're you're not to the point of where you would ever be pushing your excess solar onto the grid just because you're all electric right and so you have a high much higher um demand and so i would for potentially um as you kind of figure all of the things out I, that might be something to consider i guess i would, um, I would like to add uh, uh as it relates to lead the current amount of solar that we're providing on the site would greatly be beyond what LEED awards you points for. Just to quickly address that. <clears throat> one, one of the, um, one, we looked at, uh, you know, putting some panels on lower surfaces, but the problem is as we lower the uh, solar panels closer to the ground, <clears throat> we get a lot more shading coming into play. So we get a lot bigger, bigger reduction in the efficiency because Buildings begin to shade them, trees begin to shade them. Um, whereas on the upper roofs where we've got them placed, they're getting the maximum amount of uh, efficiency. Got it. 
Okay. Well, I'm glad you considered it. Um, and I would just say, like, I know utilities have different different uh, policies about uh, how they feel about, you know, customer cited renewables. And often it's this, like, is the grid is the grid able to handle selling it back? And you have such a high demand that I, because you're all electric, which is fantastic, which means you can actually, you can support a whole bunch more customer cited renewables before you're giving the utility heartburn um, and placing that demand on the grid. So um, I, I'm glad that you've looked at it. I would just encourage you to keep your eyes open, you know, in the future as well. I want to switch tax and talk a little bit about EVs. And you mentioned this at the end of your last um, of Commissioner Hammerschmidt's question um, to you, Mr. Moore, uh, um, about EVs uh, and the opportunity to expand that. You right now have provided 24 spots out of 726. Um, 24 spots in itself is, you know, more than I think we've seen um, in most developments. I don't think I'm speaking out of turn there. Um, but like I said, the ordinance that's coming after you would, um, so that 24 out of 726 is three and a half percent of the spots are EVs. The ordinance that we're taking up next would be um, having 10% of the spots uh, in multifamily residential be EVs. And I'm curious um, how you arrived at 24 and and what you know increasing it to 73 would mean um you know to to effectively get to that 10 percent well what one of the issues is um looking at the amount of electricity that an all electric project is going to demand of the local utility mm -hmm. um and we're really afraid we're going to be pushing the <clears throat> the demand to the point where like I said, we would be in a certain area where we would be committing to a project that we couldn't get supply adequate, uh, you know, wattage from the local utility without incurring huge cost to upgrade their infrastructure. Um, we we are we intend to have the uh, capacity um, to allow for the increase to ten percent, um, but at the at the outset, <clears throat> we just don't think we have the ability to. Um, to provide the watts to the project um, from what is available from the local utility. But but your your service is is sized to provide up to those ten percent. Is it is it sized to provide more than the ten percent? <clears throat> well, well, I mean, the, our intent is to have the the uh, pan panels uh, size to accommodate it, but we can't say that we can get that much power from the utility yet. And we won't be able to nail that down until much farther along in the process where the electrical engineering for the project has been completed. Got it. Okay. Um, well, this will come up later on. I mean, we, as we were, as Energy Commission was looking at the EV ordinance, we pulled DTE in to try to understand what this is and everything that they kept on telling what us was, it's way easier for them if they know at this stage of the process, right? Like it's, it's way cheaper to size to, to plan for it now than to try to add it on later. So um, to that end, you mentioned that like, you'll be able to scale up those spots. Are you running raceways or, or what does that mean? Like as demand for EVs increases, like. So we'll, we'll have this, the switch gear, the, the electrical panels and the conduit running from those locations into the garage, but we won't actually add the, the uh, individual conduit to the individual locations until later. Got it. And do you know what percentage of spaces you're planning to have that the the conduit run to? So so the the initial install of the conduit will go to the 24 spaces that are part of the uh, commitment for our initial EV charging stations. Mm -hmm. um, and and the idea is that those stations will be available uh, so that uh, tenants can move their cars around within those uh, uh, parking structures. So that they'll they can be parked there while they're charging and then move. So they'll be available to more than just 24 people. Right. 
I'm, I'm just, so uh, in case you haven't had a chance to review it, I don't expect that you would have read our packet. The <laughs> ordinance that's, that's being proposed was again, 10% like in new construction. So this is not your project. You know, this is an ordinance that we're taking up, um, but it's 10% would need to be installed chargers now. And all of the balance would need to have, all of the balance of your parking spots would need to have conduit run to the, to it. Um, and so the idea is that it's way cheaper to run. I mean, this is your business, right? It's cheaper to run it now than to retrofit it later on. Um, and so uh, just know that that's coming. And I think in the short term, this the fact that this is an all electric building with 24 EV spots um, is exciting. I'm not like, I'm I'm excited about this. I expect in the future, particularly as we start to roll out things to, for um, for A20, that we're going to see more and more buildings that have even more EV charging spots. Like these features will become standard. And so, while you're building now, I would just keep that in mind uh, as the you know you may you may find yourself needing to do that in order to keep pace with kind of the future development that's coming. So again, I'm supportive of this. I would, I, I think that it's exciting. Thank you for sharing the information that went into this to help us learn. Um, uh, and if any of that stuff is helpful for you as you're like figuring out all of the final details, um, I, you know, you can take it for what it's worth. Further discussion, uh, Commissioner Abrams followed by Commissioner Gabrandle. Um, I just also had a couple questions that are kind of about energy and, and sustainability goals. Um, I think we received in our communication some feedback from the sustainability manager and one of the questions there was um, using natural gas versus batteries for backup power. I wondered if somebody could maybe explain that a little bit. Or my understanding is that there's still a plan to, 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 to bring natural gas <coughs> for a backup generator? Yeah, so the code the code is requiring an electric generator uh, to back up life safety uh, systems within the buildings. And uh, typically those would be done <clears throat> with either a diesel fuel tank on site, which we're not planning to do, or a natural gas source. So that would be the only natural gas source would be that emergency backup generator. So that in the case of the loss of electricity from the grid, the things like the emergency lights and the fire alarms and the elevators, all those important life safety elements would still be supplied with power. Um, <clears throat> fortunately in Ann Arbor, um, you know, we don't have a lot of that downtime, but it's still a code requirement. But um, the suggestion was that that could maybe be done with, with battery, like a battery wall. Is that something that you've done before or thought about? That might be more resilient, offer you a better option than the natural gas. Um, I'll have to defer to, to, to Eric on his uh, feelings about current battery technology. And I don't know uh, per se what the building code has to say about it. I haven't researched that. Yeah, this is this is Eric. Uh, we have in, in the neighborhood surrounding our office, uh, Consumers Energy has installed this, this new kind of uh, very high tech battery park to be able to to store that type of energy it's uh it, it's really cutting edge at this point in time um what i will say is working on other projects such as living building challenge which is the ultimate in sustainability is that they allow natural gas generators on their project understanding that these things are just used in an emergency situation even though they do not require they do not allow combustion that is an allowable thing at this point. So it's an emerging technology. Um, I, I don't know if it's quite there yet. And I'm generally an advocate of things uh, very early on. Thank you. Um, also, you mentioned that um, earlier when you were, um, this is for you, Mr. Doyle, earlier you were talking about, um, when you were talking about electrification, you mentioned that you kind of consider efficiency first and you mentioned insulation being one of the things that allowed you to achieve Kind of energy efficiency goals for the building. I wondered, um, are there other things that are like passive systems or that are just part of the construction technology 
for the project, in addition to just being well insulated, that allow <laughs> the uh, to kind of lower the amount of electricity that you imagine the project needs. Ultimately, the uh, the users of the building have an impact in, in how that uh, that operates, and we have uh, difficulty in controlling that. But there there are a number of things that uh, that we can go through with a continued energy modeling process to try and focus on efficiency that improves that the envelope and all of the other components, even just installing Energy Star appliances, which are more expensive than uh, than your traditional appliances. They do help to reduce that that overall load. So there, there are many factors that we will potentially look at holistically with, with the design of the project to be able to, to get to that at least 8% energy efficiency um, to be able to offset the, uh, the current solar that's on there along with uh, electrification. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I think the other questions that I had have already been answered, so thanks. <coughs> Commissioner Gibrandall. Okay, just to keep beating this sustainability horse, um, uh, a couple of questions about that. One is, um, are all of the buildings, like have you chosen to basically choose some buildings to have solar on them and some not, or do they all have some component of solar on them? So the, the, the tallest buildings, um, all have the solar panels on them. Um, <clears throat> the lower the uh, townhouse buildings, um, which get shaded by the taller buildings and also by the trees, do not. Uh, but it's the taller buildings that aren't going to be impacted by any other structures or by vegetation that have them. So it's the buildings A and B. So if we could go to the, um, the renderings, slide three in particular. Okay, when I was first hearing the presentation about the green roofs and things like that, it made sense to me that, you know, things that were lower, people that would be looking over. But when I saw this rendering, I, I kind of imagined it that the buildings were stepping down themselves and that you wouldn't want solar panels right outside of your window. But when I see this rendering, there's, there's not a lot of window access into these, into these lower areas. And I get it that ones that are close up but it seems to me that there's some of these that are pretty far away from where windows are, that um, it just seems like a lost opportunity to me that there would be no solar infrastructure ready for these buildings, um, given that it looks like, you know, if, if I'm looking at, um, it's hard for me to know exactly what's happening with directions here, but if I'm looking closer to the main street, side, the building that has the L shape, um, that's big. And it seems to me that if you, like, I don't know what, like how many, you know, if that's 150 feet in each direction or, you know, something like that, maybe, um, that I, I, I and, and I don't see tons of windows really looking onto them, I guess. So I, I see some. But in terms of things that are really adjacent to it, I don't see a lot. And I think more of what those people are actually seeing is the courtyard below them than looking out over the top of the green roof. Um, and so I guess I'm, I feel like I, and green roofs are not cheap, you know, and I know they, they provide all kinds of benefits. You're, you're absolutely right. And I believe in them for a lot of reasons, but it seems to me that if we're not making like that there's two whole buildings that are going to not have the kind of infrastructure ready or you know the the conduit ready or the the um, loading ready 
to be able to potentially have solar in the future. It just feels like that's a, I, I get it in the places where it's really up close to people, but it just feels pretty far away to me um, to not take advantage of the solar in those areas. Um, and, and again, green roofs aren't cheap. You know, so I know, I'm just wondering, um, perhaps Mr. Doyle, I can pick on you a little bit more here, just in terms of kind of cost comparison, um, you know, I have a sense of green roof costs, but um, per square foot, I don't have as much of a sense of the solar costs, but is it that much more of an upgrade to take like that L and maybe take that whole corner of the L or something like that to be able to add solar panels there? Um, because it's, you know, it, it, if, if, like you said before, you really are not likely to ever meet your capacity in terms of the demand of what you have going on here, um, what's the downside, really, of not um, being able to provide more, more energy possibilities and not taxing the system, you know, for, the, for DTE by providing more of your own energy? can't address the cost differences between solar installations and uh, the, the green roof piece. What I can say is, I, I'm not sure if that rendering is, is completely accurate of all of the things that are on the roof there. We, we did look at spacing of things with all of the other mechanical equipment on the roofs, and we didn't identify any large areas that, uh, that could easily be added to. So the rendering is really not accurate is what you're telling me in terms of the decision making because it looks like there's a couple of football fields there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? In terms yeah, of what we see there. From so, my recollection of that and, and, and I'll, I'll rely on the, uh, the others that, that created the architectural drawings and the renderings, but from the information that we did our model on, I believe that there were more EV, uh, PV panels up there. In, in the green areas that we're seeing in the rendering. Yep. So Brad or, or someone else might be able to address that better than I can. Yeah, I don't have the, uh, the solar panel layout drawings here with me, um, but I think they were part of the submission packet that um, you have, uh, Matt. It is part of the site plan except the architectural set. Um, I could, if, if Brett has a hand, if not, I can um, share there. They, they all, they have within the architectural set that's displayed that we have included with the actual site plan and the layout sheets. They do show a site plan, or sorry, solar panel layouts on there. Um, and does this show the whole site at once or is it kind of building by building? It's building by, well, it's a couple buildings by, it, it, a couple buildings, it, it's groups of buildings basically. One is the large center building, which is kind of the square. It has that solar array on it, and then they have the other buildings um, off to the side. So, um, and within that, they do show some mechanical equipment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I so, don't know that. I don't know that the artist that was rendering these, you know, um, you know followed that specific uh, layout for the for the panels or uh, the specific locations of the mechanical uh, heat exchangers for the yeah. VRF system sure. on there. Right. Here, here is a, here's one of the drawings. Yes. Okay. And so, um, and so what I'm seeing, I guess I, I see up in the, so the yellow is the solar. Is that what I'm seeing? No, you what you're seeing, what you're seeing here is the floor that is uh, the, the highest level of the courtyard building. And so oh, okay. you're seeing in, in plan view, the, the green roof area along with the, uh, the uh, heat exchanger farms, okay. um, et cetera. Um, there's some dimensions on there that uh, give you the dimensions of the courtyard, but all of those uh, units that overlook the courtyard are also looking over that roof surface towards the golf course. Right, but it also seems like, oh, you know, it's it's one floor. There's still green roof in between. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know. It it it. I I completely understand if I have a window and there's a solar panel right in front of it. 
but it feels like there's quite a bit in between here, I guess. Um, and um, so it's it's a little um, it's a little hard to kind of put it together in the plans, I guess. And so maybe um, you know if this were to move on to city council, that there could be more of a sheet dedicated to how you're truly laying out the solar in relation to the whole um, to the whole uh, site plan, because I I I. I understand where you're coming from in terms of, I mean, I'll ask you for architect, I get the, like the green view thing, but if it's something that's 150 feet away from me and I have a lot of other things going on in that view, besides just, you know, then it, that feels a little less important to me, I guess. And, um, and because I know green roofs are, are not cheap, um, that I know it wouldn't just be necessarily a huge added cost. It's like you'd be taking away green roof and adding adding solar, I guess is something that I, I generally am really supportive of this project and I'm excited for a lot of the changes that you all made. Um, I, I would love to see a, a little bit more um, <clears throat> representation of the, the critical thinking process that you went through to understand that what's going on with the solar really, because I, I feel like it's hard for us to really process it in terms of the information that we got in our packet. Um, so well, I, th I think that uh, because we're already running conduit up uh, to the levels above that, uh, I think you know we can commit to enough space or enough conduits so that in the future, if it was necessary to add panels where the green roof was, that the conduits would be in place to do that. So uh, we could make it solar ready, so to speak. I would say that's the least that I would say is acceptable, um, but I would also just like to see if if it's possible to just, again, I feel like I'm not necessarily operating with like a sheet that shows me where all the solar is on the whole site to be able to kind of really understand what the issues are and, and, to, and to just ask you to think a little bit about truly what's in people's views really. You know, because all those floors, been, it's only one floor that would be seeing over it. And, um, and, and, and if it's, you know, 150 feet away, that's pretty far away, you know, in terms of what you're really taking in. Um, so I, I completely understand if it's something that's blocking your view, I get that. But if it's something that's pretty far away, it feels like maybe there could be solar there and that we could up that percentage, you know, that, that you're talking about. Um, so I guess that's something, again, I, I, I generally am supportive of this, but that's something I feel like that that could be fleshed out a little bit more in terms of you know what the potential is for this for this project. And I, I guess the other question I have is for staff, and that is you know when you first presented this, you all were recommending denial of this, and so given the sh the shifts and changes that have happened, where are you all with this now? <laughs> <clears throat> That's a great question. I knew that true question was going to come up. <laughs> um, well, our, we, as you can see from our memo that we prepared, there was no recommendation stated on there. Um, it, we didn't change the recommendation per se, but I would say that we, it's, it's made significant strides to where it's, it's so much closer. Uh, there's a couple of other, of other added items. You know, again, we touched on a little bit of sustainability, but the affordable housing is, yeah. is, was, is a bit of a sticking point. Um, but they have made, I mean, sustainability. I mean, one of the things that we were pointing out from the start is that we want the project to set at least an example in some in some ways, since they're pushing the envelope so far in our in planning staff. Well, and it's according to the master plan and everything, they're pushing it pretty far in one direction. Now they they offer the the correct or they offer justification for that. And as we said from the beginning, we were trying to look at all these master plan elements to help overcome that. Um, that pretty large disparity. So sustainability, I think they've made substantial. I mean, I think we, we can look to this and, and, and say that, but um, you know, one of the things that we were struggling with on, and we've had many conversations with this in our, in the department and stuff, but so that's kind of a roundabout way of answering the question, but yeah. that that's where we're at. That's we, where you are. Okay. That's, that, that's helpful to hear. And, 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 yeah. I, and I, that here tonight changes that. Um, yeah, there's modifications made. Commissioner Gavandal, I would I would just also add, um, you know, we uh, just I guess this is probably going to be equally as sort of round and 
Weasley is and answer as uh, city planner <laughs> Kowalski just gave. Um, but we, you know, we work hard with petitions to present our recommendation to you based on what we have. And, and in the case of this, um, I felt, you know, I, I feel like we, we did that. And then um, we, uh, to some extent, don't want to get into the way of the conversation that you started having at that point as a commission. Um, you had some specific questions, you had some specific um, ideas that you felt that uh, as a commission as a whole thought that this would uh, improve this petition in the eyes of sort of your view uh, of the commission of that balance of the land use recommendations and a lot of other land use recommendations in our master plan. Uh, Matt referenced you know, sustainability, affordability. So um, I think part of that is just recognizing too that you, as a commission, we're sort of taking your lead once we present our initial recommendation. And, and you gave the petitioner in that case some very specific direction. And at that point, our role, we looked at our role a little bit different to shift from, frankly, so analytical to making sure that we're giving you the information that you would ask for so that you can make that determination. Okay, that, that's helpful. Um, that's great summary. We really wanted to make sure, sorry, just to add to that, that all the commissioner's items were addressed methodically through there. So that would help and help formalize your opinions going forward to get the, the information that you need. Yeah, yeah. Once we've and, had our- and, and I also recognize that it's, you know, it is difficult, I said this last time too, to kind of, to, to be working on all levels in terms of affordability and sustainability. It's hard, you know, to make all the math work too. And, and that's a reality that you're just not gonna do the project if, if the math doesn't work. And so I get that. And so I guess part of the reason that I'm, that I'm pushing a little bit on the solar panel thing is because you have a green roof otherwise, which is which is also expensive, you know. And so that's that's where you know I feel like okay, well maybe we can get like stormwater is an issue, and 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 um, and you know um, insulation is an issue, but those are also addressed in different ways. Whereas we only have so much ability to be able to put solar up there, and the likelihood that it's going to be put up there later, eh, probably not going to happen, you know. So. I would add to that to that lens, I depending where the commission ends up um, in your comfort level, I mean, I think the petitioner towards sustainability goals has made a significant commitment to the combination of solar and green roof. Um, as drafted right now in the site plan and the development agreement, there are minimum solar um, uh, criteria to be met as far as uh, percentage of coverage. Um, if the commission were to move forward with this and you were comfortable with that, I would say that you could also acknowledge that you would be comfortable as the commission with those percentages increasing, um, sort of making the statement that your, recommend, your recommendation is not um, hinging upon the ratio of green roof provided in this circumstance, but rather um, the minimum that's being provided in solar um, infrastructure on this site and to the extent that that could be increased. Um, that that would be consistent with your goals. So that would be I, I, one way to sort of recognize that. Yeah, so I, I that would be great. And I'm, I'm not um, very talented at writing these things into, into the agreements. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Commissioner Mills <laughs> or Mr. Leonard, whoever wants to take it on. But um, I, I guess I would like to provide for some flexibility with to that end so that there could be, um, uh, it, if it's possible to be able to still have a quality development and quality experience within, you know, the spaces themselves so that you're not looking in the infrastructure to, it, to explore the possibility of more solar in lieu of some of the spaces where there's green roof, um, recognizing that they both are expensive items, you know, that, that you'd be trading one for the other, that, um, that again, I don't want to hold this thing up at this point for me um, on that. But I feel like that um, I would like to be able to kind of pass the baton off to city council, I guess, in that way to think about ways to, to be able to kind of reevaluate and see where there might be some possibilities with that and that whatever we would pass on, that we would somehow make that clear to the, in the next round that, um, that we'd be looking for opportunities for that because I, I agree with Mr. Kowalski. It's a big ask. I mean, it's a huge difference in, in terms of what's in our master plan currently. Not to say that there aren't issues with our master plan the way that it is in terms of you know it's in a township and all those kinds of issues. But I do feel like um, if if we're gonna 
go for something like this that is big and different and and outside of what is is really kind of on in black and white on our plan that it really should be a shining example for something and and i feel like we could go that the analysis could go a little bit further in terms of what we've been able to take in about what's happening with the amount of solar there so that's my two cents so I have Commissioner Woods, followed by Commissioner Briggs, followed by Commissioner Ackerman. Um, just to follow up on what Commissioner uh, Gib Randall was asking, I wonder if we could go back to that picture. I, I guess it was uh, page three that was showing us the uh, overview. Uh, because I was just curious about how many um, of your units would actually have a view of the green roofs. Um, or Mr. Moore, if, if if you can just tell us that, but I I, I like to know that <coughs> roughly. Um, I don't know, I don't know that I could tell you from from this um, perspective, um, but I can tell you that those are the units which are most likely to command the highest rent, um, <coughs> and and that's what helps um, make the affordable units possible um is is you know you're asking for the rest of the people in that uh development to pay a high enough price that the market will finance a a project where there's a deficit <clears throat> as the owner pointed out um, a shortfall what the market would charge for those affordable units and what they're going to be leased for so you know those units are the quote unquote penthouse units um, <clears throat> there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten uh, units um, that overlooked. That, well, eleven. Excuse me, eleven. So they have a view of the uh, green roof, and then in the distance, they can also see the golf course. Is that? Um, yeah, they would see the they would see the golf course, the uh, Chrysler Arena, and the in uh, the skyline of the city. Mm. So if you were to have solar panels there, are you uh, typically the solar panels that you use, are they the kind that kind of slant such that it blocks your view or what, what's the latest in solar panels? Yeah, they, they, they're inclined um, to uh, an optimal uh, angle to take advantage of the greatest uh, impact of the rays coming from the sun. It, it, the, that solar angle changes over the years. So it's a, it's a, compromise angle but yeah it is a sloped angle so you'd be looking at the the uh the shiny sloped surface of those panels there and there would be you know uh, some re reflectivity of of sunlight into those windows from those panels so there's going to be parts of the day where those people would have to draw their drapes um just depending upon the time of day and the solar angle but yes it's it's a sloped uh type of panel <clears throat> And are there times when the panels are just low and you can see, like uh, at a, sometime in the winter time, maybe you could still have a, you know, probably a pretty great view. No, the angle doesn't change. I don't think Eric has proposed something that, that changes the angle over the course of the year. It's a fixed angle, so it's the same year round. Oh, aren't, aren't there some where you can uh, change the angle uh, depending on how much, I mean, where you are? time of year? I don't know. Do we have, um, yeah, Mr. Doyle, could you talk a little bit about that? There are, there are panels that move along with the sun too, but all of the controls and everything with that are very, very expensive. When you're talking about a large system like this fixed up on a roof, you have to deal with wind loads, you have to deal with, deal with weight loads. Uh, during the winter, you have to deal with snow. Um, okay. The, the best cost effective way to do it is a, a fixed panel like that. And generally you're gonna be looking at around 35 or 40 degrees, uh, depending on the location. And that, that changes wherever you're at, just because of the angle of the sun during the summer is a lot higher and it's a lot lower during, during the winter. So you kind of uh, balance between those. But I would say it's probably around 38 in Ann Arbor, just off the top of my head. Mm. And so, Mr. Moore, did I hear you correctly earlier when you said, though, that you would be willing to put conduit up uh, underneath the green roof so that if in the future you decided to put solar panels in there, you would do that? 
I'm just yeah, we could we'll we would make it solar ready. We would use the same chases that will be carrying uh, the vertical conveyances for the mechanical units. We would just add electrical conduits in those chases so that in the in the future we could add panels there if it became necessary or desirable. So what would make you change your mind in the future to uh, move over, change over to solar, do you think? Would it be, well, what would it be? Boy, I, I, you know, it's difficult to predict the next six months <laughs> um, with uh, 2020 being the kind of year it's turned out to be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the economics of solar panels change and the, uh, um, you know, the desirability of the view um, is not going to change, I don't think. Um, you know, if, if for some reason uh, electricity got so expensive to buy from DTE that it was um, an overwhelming benefit to generate it on site um, and they could sustain the loss in rents from those penthouse units, mm -hmm. you know, that would be an individual operational uh, decision on the, on the part of the uh, project owner. Okay. Um, and just remind me, are these units going to be uh, individually owned or they're, they're, they're rental? No, they're rental. They're all rental. Okay. All righty. Well, well, thank you. I mean, this is interesting, Commissioner Gibb, because, Gibb Randall, because I feel like you have raised some issues and now I'm sort of like, well, should it be a green roof or should it be solar? And, you know, it is difficult. It's complicated, I guess, is how... Uh, folks say out there. I, I have seen some green roofs where for whatever reason they didn't really take off and they ended up not, you know, not really living and, you know, doing that. On the other hand, I love plants. So I, you know, would, would love to see that there. So um, if Commissioner Mills is able to come up and work her magic and have some sort of way that that, um, you know, becomes an option, a really viable option in the future that we could you know, could really look towards, or Mr. Leonard as well. Um, you know, I would be, I'd be interested in hearing what we came up with. But thank you, Mr. Moore. Far be it for me to get in the way of um, the brilliant Commissioner Mills. But I would, I would generally say that from a staff perspective, I mean, we're clearly hearing that, I, what I am hearing is that with the electrification of this, I think that I'm hearing that you are valuing the solar um, capacity over green roof. And um, as it's structured now, um, we have minimum thresholds for solar. I don't have any from a staff perspective, and I'm sure the petitioner would be happy to sort of see if there's opportunity for movement in this regard. Um, to be clear, by setting a minimum, your recommendation is going to follow that minimum. And if, if it doesn't move, it would be consistent with that. But I certainly don't have any problems without any additional language communicating with the petitioner and trans, you know, communicating that as this would progress to city council that, um, that that was a discussion and if there was opportunity to expand beyond that minimum threshold of solar that that would be consistent with the planning commission recommendation. I don't feel that that is something that you would necessarily need to craft a lot of information about as long as you were understanding that framework that we do have a minimum, it technically would be compliant with your recommendation if nothing changed but I'm happy to share this dialogue as it progresses with the materials. Could I just add something quickly to that? Um, just in terms of, since we're, we're on that train right now, I would like to understand what the real deal dimension is with the panels you're thinking about using Mr. Doyle, given the, the, the energy modeling that you're doing, what we're really talking about in terms of the dimension from the roof to where this angle hits, because if it's 2.5 feet, that's not enough in my mind to be able to justify that it's blocking the view. If it's seven feet, maybe that's something else. So um, I would like as part of that to understand truly what that is based on what standard panels you would use for this kind of thing, given the, the, um, the angle that would be optimal to be able to have that, um, to, to really see what the true impact is. Because frankly, for me, I don't buy that you're gonna have to like suddenly let go of all those penthouse roofs because you add solar panels up there. I, I, I'd like to see what the real dimensions are in terms of like making a decision about that. I don't think it's been designed enough to know what the real visual impact is for those units. So as part of moving on 
as in terms of the dialogue that you're that you're trying to um, to have, Mr. Leonard, that 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 would be part of it is really having a, a better handle. I know that's a little bit of the cart before the horse in terms of the design process, but I think you could also you know look at whatever standard panels you would use for that kind of um, setup to understand what the the view impact is. Commissioner Briggs. Um, so the final question that I heard sort of raised um, uh, from one of the callers was real uh, uh, kind of questions about whether or not um, that shared road is really designed to handle traffic um, like of the type that's being um, generated from this. And then uh, obviously we always get questions about whether or not the traffic study is valid or not. But um, the the piece around that that I had kind of a question about is I'm curious, do traffic studies now, are they beginning to model in um, uh, deliveries and, you know, that sort of, all of that, does that come into a, a traffic model? That's just kind of a curiosity question for me. And then um, for Mrs. Um, Ms. Redinger, if maybe just discussing how, um, how the city looks at that sort of shared driveway or shared road, um, and determines whether or not um, it really has the capacity to, you know, it, is it really built for something like this? First of all, I'd like to clarify that it is a city street. Mm -hmm. It is not a driveway. Mm -hmm. um, so it is a city street. It is um, approximately 30 feet wide. Mm -hmm. um, so it is, it is a, standard width for most of our residential streets and lower volume streets. It does not have curb and gutter on most of it. So there are, you know, you have an uncurved section, but other than that, it, it is, and the width is a little bit variable, but it is sufficient to support two way traffic and a parked vehicle. Um, I would, also like to reference the transportation study in that the um the the land use you know we're looking at 224 trips per day um so the the traffic volume is it's not once you spread that out across an entire day, it's not that intense. You know, their 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 peak hour trips are, um, you know, they're not they're not going to be that significant. So you really do have to spread the trips out across across the day. Um, did that answer your question? It does. I was just curious. Are these our traffic studies? Are they beginning to model sort of the incoming? non-residential um, traffic as well, or is that something that's not yet incorporated in cities? I would say that it's it's um, somewhat incorporated, you know, as uh, we rely on ITE's trip generation, as which is the industry standard for developing trip generation for a site. And the, the data set, includes a wide variety of locations. So it's locations that are more suburban, it's locations that um, may be leaning more rural, it's gonna be locations that are urban, it's going to be you know core downtown, all of those types of sites are included in the data set. And the data set includes historical data as well as more recent data that is submitted to ITE. So it, the data set includes all types of trips. Um, while we are definitely seeing a significant increase in, you know, more delivery style trips. And at this point in time, we don't really have a, a, a good understanding of are those, how many are the those trips are offsetting what would have traditionally been a trip that the household would have taken. Mm -hmm. Like if you think about a grocery delivery, 
you would have left the house and then come back if you had gone to the grocery store and a grocery delivery is coming to the house and then leaving. So that's not an additional trip. That's just a displaced trip mm -hmm. from the household to an exterior to the household. So the data set, you know, it changes over time. Um, but as far as being super up to the minute, no, it's more of a reflection of, of a historical trend and kind of building off of those historical trends. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, overall, how I'm seeing this project is, I, I, I definitely look at as um, pretty favorably, um, anticipating what kind of comes next um, it, um, at city council. I would anticipate that concerns over the movements on, on this roadway will carry a great deal of weight um, at city council. And so it's pretty unusual, quite honestly, to see a project of this level of density and have, you know, one caller calling in about that issue. So, you know, there is that, but if there are any sort of recommended changes that, or, or improvements that the city might want to see along that roadway that might make that road, um, that city street feel um, like it is uh, designed in a way that really helps to facilitate that, that greater load. Um, I'm just curious if there's, if there's anything in that capacity that might make it um, feel like this, this issue has been addressed more fully by the time it, it makes it to the next stop. I, I don't know if, if that's been a discussion or if there if if it just doesn't feel like it needs needs any improvements. Are you referring to on um, the old yeah. Main Street alignment? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, some of the well, honestly, we weren't as focused on on that particular um, street because it it yeah. will be able to handle the load. Um, it, the developer's transportation engineer conducted a safety analysis at that location and where, um, you know, and, and where, where that, the, the, that alignment meets Main Street, <laughs> Old Main Street meets Main Street, you know, there were no crashes reported. Um, for their study period, which was 2015 through 2018. So it, it didn't crop up as a, as a safety concern. The, I, I think, you know, the things that are important to, to take a look at is the non-motorized connections that they're putting in so that people don't have to get in their vehicles to be able to connect, um, you know, along, along their frontage and up to Main Street along the Main Street and Arbor Saline intersection and to be able to get to those nearby um, attractions and destinations without having to get into a vehicle. They are meeting um, the wider sidewalk width out there that's currently established. So, you know, looking at some of those other connections was where we were really focused. Yeah, I think if I could add one thing for Commissioner yeah. Briggs. Um, the ITE allows reductions for walking and biking and transit trips, but as is typical protocol city wanted a conservative view. So we applied this as if we don't have all those trip reductions, but we believe in reality that traffic impact will be less than the study showed because we've done a lot of things in terms of location and things Cynthia just mentioned to encourage people to take other trip making um, to walk, bike, use transit. And so we think our traffic impact will be less than is contemplated in the study. But that was a worst case scenario just to make sure we could mitigate if everybody drove. But we think the impact will be a lot less than shown. Yeah, that's great. I mean, all of this resonates a lot with me. Um, but um, based on concerns that sort of I hear from city council, those are not always the, the same shared ones that, that um, get voiced then. And so um, I don't, it may be helpful to really articulate um, that those are conservative estimates that are being used, but I, I was just wondering if there were additional pavement markings or different things that might um, 
uh, help make that um, old Main Street uh, feel more conducive to that increased traffic that might relieve concerns um, whether or not uh, they're shared by everybody. But that's those are just my thoughts in terms of moving forward. I'm I'm personally fine with this. We'll, we'll certainly take a look with our traffic engineer and see if we have any brainstorms in that regard. Um, I, I would point out that we're providing 450 more bike parking spaces than is required. So we're, we're hoping that we'll have other means of transportation that's used than just, you know, car trips. Yeah, I, th I think you will. Uh, Commissioner Sube and then Commissioner Ackerman. I'd be brief. One, would your lender approve financing if we had parking maximums instead of minimums that would lower your counts? Uh, as I said, they're, they're not looking at local municipalities. They're looking at um, market comparables. Um, the, the issue with lenders is they have the opportunity to loan money in communities besides Ann Arbor, and they, and they do loan uh, all over the country. So they're looking uh, not at the specific municipalities requirements, they're looking at what they believe, uh, you know, give the uh, best economic chance for the project uh, to repay its loans. So if we had maximums, you wouldn't even have sketched this out to present to a lender? Yeah, you, or, probably, wouldn't have, you probably wouldn't have a project. It, it, you know, the more likely uh, scenario then would be that, um, you know, a, a neighboring property owner would just buy it. So we've seen a previous project uh, where an adjacent municipality had lower parking requirements uh, for a national brand. And while they, since we had a, we had no maximum, they put more parking on the site in Ann Arbor versus the adjacent municipality. So we've seen that national brands have reacted to local ordinances if there are restrictions on them. So I would be curious when we're talking about uh, if you guys are doing some due diligence homework to feed back to us about how this this is a progressive project and how we can help move other things forward. We're interested in, you know, uh, the economic impact of all electrification and how we can require that um, or ask for that in the future and what the like if it creates economic burden or not and parking maximums and if it's a convenience of lending or a necessity of lending. And I'm actually not sure that not having maximums would have not made this project pan out. So I would be interested in some deeper diving into that for this project because it is a lot of parking. Um, so that, that's a question. Um, I, I think not to kind of get too deep into the solar again, my understanding when we talked about EV ready being at three and a half percent, going to 10% with conduit. One, I understand conduit with underground parking is probably easier to retrofit later because it is in building construction versus resurfacing to connect in a surface lot. So I get that you could kind of run conduit, conduit later. It does seem like part of the argument is you might not be able to get the service load provided to the parcel to meet building electrification and 10% EV stations uh, based on you know DTE servicing the site, which kind of triggers the circular conversation about if you add more solar panels, you're reducing the load you're requesting from DTE that you might be able to cover full electrification of your building and 10% plus of EV stations. So all these things kind of connect so thinking about the math looking forward, if you're right at that edge of 3.5% EV full electrification and that's your max service, I, I think more solar panels, that's that tipping point. It's a telltale sign that you're already maxed out, but it's gonna, the demand's gonna go further for more EV. So you should prep for it. Um, the third, which is a question, is how is the solar electrical renewables energy savings transferred either to ownership or tenants throughout the buildings. Since we are seeing an increased electrical cost <coughs> by going to electrification, 
Are we going to see all of the tenants have an increased electrical bill every month? And then with the solar, how is that distributed savings uh, throughout the project? I'll let, I'll let Eric speak to that. Um, it's my understanding, Eric, that the, the solar panels are generating electricity and then any uh, gap a need comes from Edison. So that, that varies over the course of the day and the weather and the season. Um, but as to the percentage of, uh, that's good. You're going to have to figure that out. I don't know that. Yeah, I don't know if we have an answer to that right now, because generally with an apartment project like this, you have individual meters for each of the, uh, the tenants themselves. And I, I don't think that we have gotten that far in, in figuring out where the, where the energy is actually going at this point in time. What I can say to address the, uh, the added cost of that is that I believe with the added efficiency that we're looking at to try and uh, align with the, the lead goals is that that would balance that out. And multifamily projects are significantly more energy efficient than uh, single family homes and even smaller multifamily projects like this. So the cost that the tenant would actually be paying would be comparable. Probably it would be less is my hunch. Okay. But, and just, but just in the, is, in the, in the early energy model that we did, those are just the predictions that we have right now. And this is very early in design too. Sorry. No, no problem. A, a footnote to that is when the city calculates um, affordable uh, affordability of units, utilities are, are incorporated into that. So um, as it relates to that, um, we actually look at utility schedules, electric, if electric um, utilities are projected to be estimated to be higher, that's gonna result in less rent that could be charged and still meet that target. For those 15 units? Yep. Okay, great. That was kind of part of that question in terms of, even if you're getting an affordable unit, <laughs> all of a sudden you have a higher energy bill than an affordable unit elsewhere. Um, yeah, so those are it. I, I, I think there's some wiggle room between EV, the amount of service load, and solar panels to look at. So I appreciate the idea that there's a minimum, but that there can be some work to be done as this thing moves forward. Um, and I would like to hear feedback about just the construction costs and how you were able to do a pretty rapid turnaround to get to full electrification confidently to present this back to us. Um, and parking maximums because this is a lot of parking especially when you've met you've really exceeded bike parking and you are along such a corridor uh it, it it's it is hard to understand that the lender wouldn't look at this unless their national numbers shook out so i'd be interested in hearing more about that thanks commissioner ackerman okay um i I do have a question for Mr. Kowalski. Um, so the staff's uh, previous recommendation from when this was here in front of us last month was denial. Can you walk us through why that was the case? Can you just give us the rundown? Sure. Yep. Um, no, ab absolutely. Because it's, 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 a it's a tough project. Obviously, there's a lot of elements in this project. I mean, the initial recommendation really was based upon some of the initial plan sets that we got and, and the plan set that was presented to Planning Commission uh, the first time, which was uh, in planning staff's opinion, we felt, you know, that as I still say, that the density is, is a huge discrepancy between what the master plan has and this. So based on that, and, and again, some of the other items that I've mentioned that we've always been trying to bring them along as far as sustainability and affordability, those were not all, I mean, the sustainability wasn't as flushed out as it, as it is now, and, and neither was the affordable housing. So, I mean, really, we were looking at such a disparity in one, in, you know, one of our primary master plan elements, which is that land use element in that recommendation. And granted, that may be originally from old, but that's still our valid uh, master plan for that area. And the discrepancy is huge to overcome that and to give them justification and, and ultimately planning commission, planning staff, and, and city council. Um, you know, we've tried to push them in the other direction. So I, we feel it's a lot closer, as we've mentioned, but really the initial recommendation was just based on, on a project that we felt had a lot of positivity to it, but still was lacking in, in areas 
to overcome that the huge discrepancy in some of the original planning of it, it regarding like the density and, and some of the design and, and including some of the parking concerns as well. And we've come a long way on some of those, um, on others, not as much, but so yeah, really, I mean, again, a project's evolved since you guys have seen it the first time significantly, but um, you know, there's, there's still a little ways to go in planning staff opinion. Thank you. Um, I guess where I'm, you know, so I, a lot of, by the way, great questions and great discussion today on this item. Um, I sort of went into this uh, after reading the, the packet and the updated information, sort of going back and forth on it. Um, I like the affordable housing aspect of this. Um, I like the, the green aspect of it, um, especially with our uh, initiatives that have recently uh, come around the, the climate emergency. Um, and so I, I like where this project is going. My concerns are still the density um, for this area and traffic. Um, and so I'm still sort of like struggling with this, like it's getting me to a yes vote, um, but I'm not 100% there because of the density. It's this is, you know, compared to what staff initially came back with, uh, with regards to density and uh, where it should be and where it is, it's a huge number, uh, really big, uh, lots of parking, lots of traffic concerns. So I'm still sort of on the, I'm, I'm going back and forth, whether this is a yes or a no for me. Um, I think this is going to have a hard time getting through city council. Um, I, 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 I can, no matter how we vote, it's going to have a really hard time getting through city council. Um, so, um, yeah, that's sort of where, where I'm at. And after listening to this discussion, I'm still sort of sitting here saying, which direction do I go? Um, because I am conflicted with the, with the density and traffic. Uh, Commissioner Mills. So one of the things that I love about being on planning commission is all of the questions that everyone asks and um, the perspectives that they bring means that like I change my thoughts about a project as I go through um, or at least like how much of it is just a is a passing comment versus like a conviction that I think should be brought up. Um, I think that a lot of the questions about kind of where staff is on this and the gravity, maybe that's the, like how big of a rezoning this is. Um, and so making sure that, that we have, we're really, we feel like even if the density recommendation that is made in the master plan, this exceeds that, that we're make, meeting so many of the other elements that of course this is in keeping with our master plan. That's what I, that's, that's where I kind of want to make sure that we're heading. And this is why I'm going to push more um, following up to what Commissioner Sauve said about, about looking again at the energy aspects. Um, I think that I understand the argument about affordability, um, and, and I appreciate kind of the number of units there. I, I'm seeing that one of the key things that could come out of this though is kind of um, it being an exemplar for sustainability and hitting all of those elements within our master planning compendium. Um, but I don't think it's there yet. And I think that some of it is just going back and looking at it a little bit more carefully. Um, what Commissioner Sauve said about, you know, Yes, I understand that adding an additional 50 EV parking spots, EV chargers from the get-go, like that's going to, bringing it up to 10% could, that's a lot of additional, um, you know, the size of service that you need, it puts additional tax kind of on the grid there. But if you're offsetting that by producing more of your own power, I think that there are some opportunities to actually meet that. And if, Again, I don't, I don't want to presuppose what's going to happen in our next, the, the next uh, petition that we talk about after, you know, we make a recommendation here. Um, but if the baseline that we're requiring of any development that we see six months from now is that they have 10%, I don't think that 
that three and a half percent is going to cut it. Like in my mind, that's not an exemplar of sustainability. And so the other thing that Commissioner Give Brandel brought up, you know, was pushing you on and I think is really important is, um, sure, I get that a green roof could have some amenities, but you were talking about running um, the conduit to make it solar ready to where the mechanicals are with, amidst those green roofs. Like, I don't understand how solar panels are any uglier than the other mechanical equipment that is within your green roof area, personally. So I, I, don't, I don't necessarily buy that that green roof is such a benefit to those neighbors in comparison to, to solar. Um, so I would feel a lot better if I knew that that was sorted out. And among the, re the kind of the energy calculations and like that that's really solid. Among the reasons is because, you know, we have a carbon neutrality plan. The idea of having 10% of cars on e EV chargers <laughs> um, isn't gonna cut it. We're gonna need much more of the people who decide to bring cars into this city to have those cars be able to be electrified with a clean grid your building i hope lasts you know 50 years or more and so the infrastructure that you build now is going to be around and so just being solar ready but not like really thinking about it like you're you're gonna have to have you know space on the <laughs> you're gonna have to have a service that's able to electrify more of those vehicles i think um and so i i personally would feel more comfortable like i i have some language, as you might imagine, that effect that we could put in saying, um, you know, reconsider the balance between green roof and and solar panel kind of area. Um, at the very least, I would want to make sure that the the can or I don't know that we can do this. Maybe this is a question for staff. In the proposed motion, there are a number of conditions. One of the things that I would note, I don't think staff that we can't suggest a condition. Is that right? Uh, you can, yeah, you can discuss whatever you want, but just to be clear, um, it is ultimately at the discretion of the petitioner to, to, to propose it. You can, you can suggest, but um, right. it is solely um, within their purview whether or not to offer. They have, they have proffered conditions for you to consider, but it's, it is appropriate to discuss how those could be amended. Super, okay. So what I would say makes me uncomfortable with the current conditions that are offered um, is that it does note that it would be fully electric, which is great, like that's important to me. Again, if, you know, to make sure that this is, a, is meeting all of, this, many of the elements, the sustainability elements within our master plan, that's really important. But it's missing the solar component that we've been talking a lot about. There's no mention of solar in that. And so that's making me uncomfortable because if we were to approve this and city council then approves it, um, a future developer would not be tied to your site plan. They would be tied to those conditions, that's right. And so there's nothing then that would ensure that a future developer offers at least as much solar as you're showing. And like I say, I think it ought to be more. I think you should go back and see if it can be more as a way to increase the number of EV charging. Also kind of the level, right now our ordinance does not require EV charging stations. We hope, well, again, that may change soon. <laughs> um, putting that in here, um, putting a, a, a level of EV charge, a minimum, not a maximum, a minimum level of EV charging stations in here, again, as a, um, to ensure that, that what a rezoning would accomplish is many of those sustainability elements of our master plan, in my mind, gives me much more comfort that that rezoning is not gonna, it's not gonna stick us if, you can't get your lender to um, to to deal with our you know the less parking that we're we're hoping for. So um, those are the things that I kind of think need to be um, I, that I'm uncomfortable with. I guess I can ask the petitioner how they feel about those couple of conditions, but I'm also kind of looking to other planning commissioners to see if 
there's any interest in maybe uh, encouraging the developer to rethink on this on the energy elements and come back to us again effectively a postponement but maybe i should let the developer talk sorry it's getting late for me as you might imagine um, my client's a little frustrated in that they they have been over backwards to do what they were asked the first time and now they're being asked to do even more um, and the likelihood of, of ending up with a project which is completely uh, financially infeasible. Uh, um, oh, um, I would have to uh, have a little sidebar discussion with my client to see how they felt about uh, tabling. Commissioner Woods, did you have a comment to make or were you, yeah, go ahead while Mr. Moore has a, has a conversation, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I am, um, I mean, I appreciate what, the develop, what um, Mr. Moore and his team are saying, but the reality is we, you know, we're moving from a place where our staff has said this project should be denied. And we took a lot of time looking at this and deciding well, there's a lot going on here. And now, you know, this is the second go around on this. So while I appreciate that they may need to, um, you know, talk it over and everything, I think should also realize that this really is a big ask. And quite frankly, I would be in favor of postponing as well. Um, because I think as I've listened to the discussion around the table, there are still some very legitimate items that planning commissioners have brought up that will need to be decided and i heard someone say earlier take it on the city council you know but uh i don't know what the odds are that it would that that you'd be much more successful i think really this is where um perhaps we can give it a really good uh look through so i appreciate that maybe it's costing them some money but the reality is this is something that's going to last for 50, 60 years or whatever. So it's gonna, you know, it's it's gonna be something that's going to be here in our city as well. And that's what we're charged with doing. So I don't think that we should feel guilty because it's gonna cost them money. Yeah, it's but it's also gonna make them a lot of money too. So I just wanted to say that as well. But Mr. Leonard, I think you were gonna say something. Well, I would um I would just encourage the point with this is the second um discussion of this item. I think the planning commission has provided some suggestions and direction to the petitioner. Um, at this point, I, I guess I would encourage, you know, ultimately the commission has, you can decide to recommend approval, denial, postponement if you need more information. But um, I would, I guess I would encourage the commission to at least offer the opportunity to the petitioner if they're interested in considering these aspects. And, and if not, um, sort of retain the option to base your decision on what's before you then this evening. So that just sort of a process suggestion. So um, let me just be clear on uh, what you've suggested that the ownership and design team take some additional uh, time to scrutinize. Um, I think what you've asked is that the uh, team uh, evaluate whether or not there's an opportunity to incorporate additional solar and reduce the green roof. And I think we have also been asked to um, analyze whether or not we could increase the number of EV charging stations that would be uh, installed in the outset of the project. Is that, the, is that what I'm hearing are the two significant things you'd like us to take another crack at? Yes. Um, the other thing that I would add is consider whether or not you might offer as a condition um, putting those in along with kind of the, you know, the, the conditions associated with the zoning. So I'm, I'm assuming that we would make the number of EV stations part of the approved site plan as opposed to a condition? 
Are you suggesting that the number of EV stations would be better off as a condition as opposed to an element of the site plan? What I'm suggesting is that particularly on the solar, the, 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 you know, whether you count it in square, square feet or in, you know, kilowatts, um, that, that, a minimum is enumerated as a can I would feel more comfortable if a, a minimum was enumerated because what I'm concerned about is that once we rezone the site plan doesn't necessarily the a future owner is not beholden to the site plan a future owner is beholden to the zoning associated with it so well, currently so currently that language is part of the development agreement you're suggesting that we should consider um, all right so Based on what I've heard, my my ownership uh, has agreed uh, to that we will reinvestigate these issues if we could be back before this body fairly quickly. Uh, the, the thing we risk is, is that the options to purchase these parcels are not indefinite and we really need to move forward in a timely basis or we lose the ability to do anything on this parcel. Mr. Leonard, how quickly could we get him back? Uh... Could we get them, although we have a full, pretty full agenda on the 21st, I think it is. Um, could we get them back there? Or can we get them back on the agenda on the 21st? Yes. Um, could we, okay. Uh, Commissioner Ackerman. Thanks, just one more item, uh, if we're gonna talk to you all again in two weeks. Um, the, so I, I Ms. Redinger's advice, I went back into the development agreement and I found the portions around traffic um, mitigation or rather the traffic control uh, plan. And it seems like it's it's flexible language, um, but makes reference to the engagement toolkit. Um, and I think that all makes sense. There's a dollar amount that's blank, uh, which references the developer's contribution to those improvements. Um, what's the anticipation of, of the developer's commitment there? Is, is there? Are they funding the entire amount and we're just waiting to see what that is or what's, what's the expectation? I was going to look this in there and maybe uh, flush, have that number, at what point we would have that number flushed out basically is your question, correct? Regarding what their total contribution would be? Yeah, I guess I'm more interested in as, as a percentage than what the dollar amount is, right? Um, you know, we wouldn't be making these improvements if it, if, if it weren't to accommodate this. So I'm just curious about what the cost share is. Okay, do we, um, Cynthia, do we have any idea on when, on what those numbers may be? At what point that's decided? Well, I can address the question of the cost sharing, and that is that the cost will be borne by the developer. It's it's not um, it, it's not work that we would be engaging in, as there are currently um, no safety problems at that intersection. We don't have a recorded crash history, or so we wouldn't be making any changes to that median opening. Understood. Okay, that's what I want to hear. Okay, so do I have a motion to postpone until our July 21st meeting? Moved by Commissioner Mills, seconded by Commissioner Woods. Um, any sorry. sorry, can I just ask one? I, I wanted to ask a clarification question regarding some of Planning Commission's requests. Was there an additional request revolving around the the parking issue to investigate that further or no? Because I, I did have that noted as something that um, was mentioned by a, a couple of commissioners. I mean, I know the petitioners obviously responded, but I, I didn't know if that was something you wanted them to further or if there's additional explanation that you were looking for with that. Yeah, and I, I had the question of maximums for financing. I know we're not gonna change an ordinance to hit have maximums, so it's not something that they could meet. Um, but in terms of that parking too, when we talk about EV and percentages, 10% when they have more parking, we're not talking about 10% of the minimum parking, we're talking 10% of all of the parking. So those two things creep up together. So I just kind of want to make that point too when we're discussing these things um, and kind of what, what we're looking for as well. So something that's worth maybe them having a conversation with 
the developer between now and then. Mr. Kowalski, I also or, talked about parking and I think based on what we've heard, I'd rather you spend time and energy pursuing solar and EV. And that said, if there are inroads, let's explore them. But solar and EV seem to be like really up there. Okay. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Any further discussion on the postponement? All right, Mr. Leonard, can we do a voice vote? Um, all right, all those in favor of postponement, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All no. Right. We have one one no, is that correct, on the postponement? All right, we have one no on the on this one. So uh, we are postponed until July 21st on this item. Um, all right, it is 1017 and we are over an hour past our uh, break. So I would like to take a quick uh, five minute break. So let's reconvene at 1022. So I will see you all shortly.
Um, all right, Mr. Leonard uh, and uh, Mr. Khan, welcome. Um, I will we'll start with the, the presentation, um, then we'll head into a public hearing and then uh, discussion and a vote. So Mr. Khan, or I'm not sure who's, who's doing the presentation, but take it away. Um, well, Charles and uh, Carlene, the new faces, uh, so you understand who, who all has been part of uh, this uh, effort. Um, uh, so, you know, Lynn Garcia, and you know, Charles um, Griffith. We also um, have uh, Simi Barr from the um, Office of Sustainability, who is replacing Emily Drennan, who uh, moved to Baltimore. If there are other folks who want to introduce themselves, uh, feel free. Otherwise, um, Carlene and Charles can lead us through the presentation. All right. Good night, everyone. Um, I'm Carlene Colvin Garcia, and I am a member of the Ann Arbor Energy Commission. And I'm joined tonight by three other EV Readiness Working Group member uh, folks who are um, going to be hopefully helping a lot tonight. Uh, to contribute information, valuable information that will help you in the decision that you'll be making later on. So as Jeff said, Charles Griffith is going to be presenting with me, along with me, Charles Griffith from the Ecology Center. Also, we have John Mursky, uh, Vice Chair of the Energy Commission, and Anna Stefanopoulou, also member of the working group. She, uh, Anna is the Director of the University of Michigan Energy Institute. And uh, I want to thank you for working us into your schedule tonight. And um, just really quickly, uh, the EV Readiness Working Group was created by the Energy Commission, um, and it included a total of 11 regular participants. And uh, the former commission chair, Wayne Appleyard, was a member, as well as Emily Drennan, who was a former OSI staff member. Um, Energy Commissioners Jay Zocker and Chuck Hookham were also part of the group as well as five other local volunteers with uh, significant expertise and personal experience in the EV area. So we've been working on this project uh, since 2018. And I'm gonna really quickly go through uh, a slide presentation for you this evening. And um, uh, then we'll dive into more of the nitty gritty. So if you can go to the slide two, please. All right. So uh, US-wide, the transportation emissions account for 29% of total greenhouse gas emissions. And um, this sector has been rising where other sectors has, have been declining. Um, uh, next slide, please. And this slide shows us uh, transportation greenhouse gas emissions by source. You'll see the different um, Categories of vehicles, light duty vehicles comprise 59%, where medium and heavy duty um, trucks comprise 23%, aircraft 9%, other 4%, ships and boats 3%, and rail 2%. Next. And um, the um, greenhouse gas emissions by sector for the city of Ann Arbor, which is according to the um, the way that Ann Arbor inventories its emissions. Um, the transportation accounts for only 17 to 18% of our total emissions um, because it's excluding emissions from air, rail, ship, and boat travel, and also from most of the medium and heavy truck travel. Um, and also a portion of uh, the commuters into Ann Arbor um, uh, are not included also. So regardless, the emissions are significant. So the Ann Arbor City Council has directed that Ann Arbor reduce its community-wide greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, this, this, since 2012, uh, when it first adopted the, the Climate Action Plan. And then last year, Council unanimously approved a resolution declaring a climate emergency and directing city staff to develop a plan to achieve carbon neutrality by 2030. Next. So this brings us to um, the current plan, the uh, 820 plan, and it has six key strategies, the second of which 
is switching our appliances and vehicles from coal, gasoline, diesel, propane, and natural gas to electric. And so this is what the EV Readiness Working Group, um, that's the context in which we've been operating in creating this ordinance that we're gonna be presenting to you tonight. And at this point in time, I'd like to turn things over to Charles. We'll do a deeper dive into the development of the EV market. And he will inform us about the project, uh, the projected local growth in demand for EV charging, uh, charging types and costs, and will give us a summary of other ordinances as well as ours. Charles? Thanks, Carlene. Yes, I'll move quickly through this. Uh, this slide really just shows a couple of uh, EV forecasts, growth forecasts, representing the percentage of vehicles expected on Michigan's roads by through 2050. Um, uh, consultancy uh, put this together based on a couple of different forecasts, a more moderate one uh, on the bottom in blue, and then a more aggressive one by Bloomberg, Bloomberg New Energy Finance on the top. Um, as you can see, this can put Michigan, you know, um, in a point where there's as many as a million EVs on the road by 2030, given the, the more aggressive strategy. And that would represent roughly 6 to 11% of all registered vehicles in the state. Next slide. Um, we took this MJ Bradley analysis and, and sort of parsed it down to Ann Arbor based on where we are, where we of course have higher adoption rates in our city than most parts of the state. So if you took those same growth rates and applied them to Ann Arbor, we could go from having roughly 1500 registered electric vehicles uh, in the Ann Arbor area as of last year to as many as 60,000 uh, and by 2030, a fairly dramatic increase, I would say, from just a decade ago. Um, if um, you know, I put it putting it another way, if if EVs are making up roughly, you know, less than a half half of a percent of the registered vehicles um, in it in the Ann Arbor today that could rise to as much as 15 to 20% of all registered vehicles by 2030. Next slide. Um, uh, this slide shows another analysis we did trying to project the amount of electric vehicle charging infrastructure that would be required citywide um, over the next few years. And as you can see, it starts to increase quite significantly based on, again, those moderate and aggressive growth projections that we saw on the last slide. Um, in short, we, we need to have a lot more charging infrastructure available uh, across uh, a number of different sectors, um, the most important of which is really the um, home, but we're not counting single family homes in this particular slide, but we're counting other workplace, public, um, and then fast charging, which is, is kind of the ultra high um, uh, quick, quick charging stations that um, are required uh, mostly for sort of highway travel or longer distance travel. All right, next slide. Um, Carlene, I don't know if you wanted, we're gonna take it over from here or not. Well, sure, if you'd like me to, just uh, the, the, the basics for the EV ordinance. It's in the Unified Development Code. It's a zoning-based ordinance, and it's intended to prepare for the demand um, for EV charging based on the projections for growth. And the, the justification for the uh, requirements for installing um, EV charging infrastructure um, is that it significantly costs less, and, and the basically the cost we've seen is about one approximately one fourth of the cost uh, uh, from the um, the studies that have been done so far, and um, 
it applies to all projects requiring site plans. This is included in, in the ordinance. And um, we're not the only city that, that, have, that is considering this or um, that has done this. Other cities throughout the United States have, um, have uh, adopted ordinances and um, we actually used, um, we, we referred to them and we connected with a few cities in, in the research for, um, for what we've created here. And um, also the ordinance ha um, has, it requires a percentage of new parking spaces be um, one of three categories, which is either EV capable, EV ready, or EV installed. Next. This here is um, a quick graph that of a study that was done in the city of San Francisco comparing the different, the cost between installing EV charging infrastructure um, with a new construction versus as a retrofit and the savings are like I said about one one about 75 percent so it costs about a fourth to install um, in new construction versus you know, versus retrofits next uh, here's a, um, a quick little chart of some of the cities that have already established ordinances for for EV charging infrastructure and um, they, they approach it in, in different ways from each other. And um, so for example, in Boulder, um, you know, they, they have differences between residential and multifamily and commercial different requirements. Uh, residential um, is they require 100% EV uh, capable or EV ready. And then for multifamily 10% uh, for the buildings with 25 or more spaces and then uh, for two, two for parking lots with 25 or more spaces. And then for commercial properties, 10% um, for buildings with more than 25 spaces. And then two uh, for parking lots with 25 or more spaces. So like each, each city approaches it differently. Um, if you wanna dwell further on this slide, if there's anybody would like to look at it longer, just let me know. Otherwise we can go to the next slide. Arlene, in the interest of time, um, I want to make sure that the planning commissioners get a chance to get into the meat of the matter. Are there yes. any? Are there one or two other slides that you wanted to cover before we get into the um, the, the ordinance language itself? Um, this slide we're going to cover later. Keep going. Uh, as far as what we've covered so far, the, I think the remainder of the slides are actually going to. These are excerpts from the actual ordinance, so we can just we can just transition and dive into the ordinance itself. Okay. So at this point, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the structure of the ordinance. The structure of the ordinance is there are, um, there are three primary sections of where we're gonna be adding to the, or modifying the unified, uh, unified Development Code. So this is all within the um, Article 4 Development Standards, uh, Section 5.19, Parking Standards. So, um, and not all, actually, one part of it is in Article 8 Definitions. So gonna, we're gonna be adding nine new terms uh, to the definition sections of, of, the, uh, of the ordinance. We also will be adding to Article 4 development standards. Um, some, we're gonna be having some changes. So there's one section, 5.19.1 uh, applicability, that uh, we want to add uh, to Section A, where it says no new building shall be erected unless the parking for bicycles, motor vehicles, and electric vehicles. We're gonna be adding the term electric vehicles required by this section 5.19 is provided. We also want to add um, item E to this section. It says all new site plans for city council are required to provide EV charging facilities consistent with the requirements of section 5.19. And then we're going to be adding requ uh, um, a, a column to table 5.19-1 off street parking spaces required. And um, this a column will be titled required electric vehicle charging spaces 
So that's that's for um, the section 5.19.1 applicability. So then uh, another section uh, is uh, 5.19.8 design of vehicle parking facilities. We will are uh, recommending to add five subsections, and those are letters G through K, or no. G through four sections, uh, G through J. Sorry, there was a small edit that was done at the last minute. I apologize for that. And um, do you want me to actually read the detail on that? No, I, I think it might be good just to read the headings. Um, and I, I think most uh, commissioners have had a chance to look at this. Uh, so why don't you summarize the headings and then um, we can um, uh, get into the table. Got it the headings um so for instance i um, would just i i feel like i just i want to zoom through this real quick um so we have go ahead jeff like what would you like what would you like me to well uh on? heading heading g uh relates to um all parking um needing to um have um uh, at least the per, uh, percent of EV charging infrastructure. Um, H um, describes um, <clears throat> um, where uh, parking spaces are separated into distinct areas, separate garages or lots, EV charging infrastructure shall be evenly distributed. Um, and I is the proposed placement and installation of EV infrastructure and equipment uh, shall not allow any uh, for any violation of the ADA Act. And then um, lastly, J is the renewable electrical supply, which is um, a recommendation for folks to use solar to really bring this full full circle. So that's, I just, um, yeah. I want to add about that. The re It's a recommendation. We were told that there's no precedent in the code for there to be a recommendation. The code is for mandates. So we just want it, but we feel like it's extremely important to include this considering where we are with, um, with the A20 initiative and, and what we're dealing with at this point in time with the interest of in city council and addressing climate change. So the, the final section, section K, uh, includes a number of different um, detailed um, design accommodate, design details for, for installation of the EV charging stations. And uh, several of these are part of what was uh, designed or, uh, and included based on questions from our previous presentation to you. Going back to the um, the parking table that I mentioned earlier, the off street parking space is required. The, the column on the far right uh, is the, the column that requires the electric vehicle parking spaces. It presents the different percentages of, of required EV parking spaces, uh, EV charging parking spaces, I'm sorry. So um, there are, just uh, real quick here, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm looking for a quick little um, summary that I had and I'm going to get there in a second. Here we go. So there are There are nine different formulas that we have ranging from a requirement of 0% of EV charging spaces, parking spaces to 100% of EV charging parking spaces. And um, it's zero, we have 0%, 20%, 35%, 50%, and 100%. And the 100%, there are several, there are several formulas that, that are 100%, and those are primarily for residential types of zones. And um, there's, there's single family, there's, there's duplexes, townhomes, there's multifamily units, and they have different different formulas. 
let's see what you have here now so I can address that. All right, yeah, yeah, this is this is good here. So here you get a, 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 a feel for like what is included in the parquet table, the, the different percentages. And, and Sarah, earlier this evening, or just the, the discussion with the, with the Valhalla project, you, you were talking about the different uh, requirements of 10%, which is they had 3.5%, I think, and, and this ordinance would re have required 10% had it been in place at the time. So um, would you like to go into further detail about the different particular um, zones or property uses? And, and how that would apply, how the, the, the formulas would apply. Essentially, the, um, the, the architects or engineers would take the required, total required number of parking spaces and apply these percentages to derive the, the um, number of required EV capable or EV ready or EV install, installed parking spaces to include. Here's a good summary. Maybe I can finish up um, just summarizing the staff recommendation, and then we'll open up the public hearing if that's okay with everyone. Uh, staff recommends that the amendments to the Unified Development Code be approved because the proposed amendments will result in the increase in the number of electric vehicle charging facilities, which is consistent with the city's policies regarding uh, the pursuit of carbon neutrality and environmental sustainability. Thank you. All right, at this time, I would like to open up the public hearing on this item. Um, this is an opportunity for persons to speak for up to three minutes about the proposed, uh, uh, the proposed um, amendments to Chapter 55 Unified Development Code to amend parking standards to require electrical vehicle infrastructure for new development projects requiring a site plan for city council approval. Public comments may be made by calling 877-853 and then entering meeting ID 941-3631-2895. This information is also displayed on the meeting agenda and video feed. City staff will select callers that have raised their hand using the last three digits of your phone number. In order to electronically raise your hand after dialing into the meeting, press star nine on your phone. You'll hear an automated announcement that the host is allowing you to speak. When speaking, please move to a quiet area and mute any television or background sound so that we may hear you clearly. Please state your name and address at the beginning of your comments. Uh, Chair, I gave you a wrong meeting ID number there. The correct meeting ID for this meeting is 976-0979-8996. But well, we do have callers waiting. Great. Call Hello, phone number uh, my name one one eight. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Milt Baker, and I live at six twenty eight Green Road in Ann Arbor. And tonight, you will be considering amendments to the city parking standards. The Planning Commission is to be commended for including EV charging. However, the plan before you tonight should mandate solar EV charging. Mm -hmm. uh, reference the Valhalla project. Why a mandate? An EV charged by today's electrical grid emits 20% less greenhouse gases than an ICE engine vehicle. Why focus on a 20% reduction when solar charged EVs emit 100% less greenhouse gases? When the issue of solar charging is brought up, we hear a number of arguments against it. We hear that Ann Arbor will have renewable electricity by 2030 anyway, so what do we need solar charging for? DTE's goal for net zero carbon is 2050, not 2030. We here in Arbor will buy clean power elsewhere. The principle of physics tells us that electricity will take the path of least resistance and be consumed close to the point of generation, not here. We also hear that we cannot require EV charging, uh, solar charging, because it will be illegal for anybody but DTE to sell electricity. There would be no selling of electricity with this mandate. And finally, what I hear is we simply can't mandate solar charging. Why? A number of cities and states have mandated solar in new construction, so why can't we? So where will the money come from to install this solar infrastructure? The proposed ordinance requires EV space infrastructure for 100% of multifamily residents and hotel parking. 
is this level of infrastructure required for the projected EV population in 2050 and beyond? Some experts don't agree and have written this committee. A much better ROI, in my opinion, would be mandating developers to invest in solar arrays instead of conduit in the ground, which may or may not be used. If we want to drive A20, swapping unneeded infrastructure for solar charging that will immediately reduce greenhouse gases is a good deal for Ann Arbor citizens. I urge the Planning Commission to include mandated solar EV charging in the new parking ordinance. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. If there are any other um, callers who wish to address the Planning Commission, please press star nine. The proposed ordinance requires EV space infrastructure for 100% for multifamily residents and hotel parking. Ms. Mitchell, level of infrastructure you have three minutes to address the Planning Commission. In 2050 and beyond, some experts don't agree and have written this committee. A much better ROI, in my opinion, would be mandated. Hello, caller with phone number ending in 194. You have three minutes to address the Planning Commission on the EV ordinance. That will immediately reduce greenhouse gases is a good deal for Ann Arbor citizens. I urge the Planning Commission to include mandated solar EV charging in the new parking ordinance. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Is there any other? Hello, Ms. Mitchell, would you like to address the Planning Commission on EV parking? Yes, I would. Go ahead. Okay, hi, this is Rita Mitchell. My address is 621 Fifth Street. And I, um, first off, I would just wanna say that your discussion of the Valhalla project was excellent. Thank you for asking those detailed questions and for pressing the developer to use more solar panels on site for this electric project, it's excellent. Um, and I want to thank you for working to prepare the changes for the UDC to support char charging electric vehicles for developments that require site plans. It's a start for our community and a much needed one. And I ask that you make the minor, minor modification and require solar powered charging stations for the developments that qualify for the ordinance change. That's not everyone, but it's, but it's a significant number and a way to start. We're experiencing a climate emergency. You all know that. You acknowledge the City Council's action to reach carbon neutrality by 2030. We're at a point that requires rapid, disruptive action to provide the energy for the future that will allow us to sustain our local environment and to markedly reduce our use of fossil fuel-generated power. The inclusion of solar-powered EV charging stations is a small but important way to reduce the carbon emissions in the city of Ann Arbor through on-site use of energy generated. It will avoid the established electricity grid emissions that otherwise will power EV charging with coal, natural gas, which is methane, or nuclear fuel. Those are dirty and risky energy sources, and they contribute to environmental injustice nearby us. If Ann Arbor proceeds with the use of grid-based EV charging that is generated from, River Rouge, from the area of, of River Rouge to Monroe, we'll essentially be exporting our fossil fuel production and new, nuclear energy risk to those communities that surround the power plants in those areas. At this critical point, we should do all we can to reduce our participation in actions that result in harm to frontline at-risk communities. DTE plans to close coal plants, which is excellent. But continued use of natural gas is not clean. From its fracked extraction to transport through leaking pipelines and the end point of combustion, use of natural gas is a way to continue with legacy, outdated fossil fuels and the attendant greenhouse gases. So I ask that you take a leading small and powerful step into the renewable energy future. Please require solar panels with installation of EV charging stations. It's a start, it's a small step, but we can do it. Your action will support transition to a true clean energy future seconds, for Ann Arbor <laughs> and will be a small part of contributing to environmental justice for our neighboring communities. Thank you very much and thank you all for your service. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. If there are any other callers who wish to address the Planning Commission, please press star nine.
Uh, hi, uh, Ken Garber again, 28 Haverhill Court. Um, great discussion on Valhalla Glen. I really appreciated the commission's thoughtfulness. Um, on the EV charging amendments, I want to commend all the people that worked so long and hard on that uh, for two plus years. Uh, I strongly support it. Very aggressive requirements in terms of numbers of required charging stations. Personally, I have zero EV experience. I've never even driven one. I'm more of a bicycle and transit guy. Um, it's obviously going to be a late night for you guys, and I hate to further muddy the waters, but um, I also want to bring up um, solar, um, like the last two callers. Uh, I'm sure the working group considered mandating solar. It must have its reasons not to do that, uh, but maybe we can take at least limited measures. Um, consider this, um, require solar for commercial and multifamily residential uh, installed EV charging stations, um, recognizing that not all single family dwellings are suitable for solar. Um, for these open parking lots, as I envision them, require every EV installed space be coupled to photovoltaic, ph eh, photovoltaic cells with a minimum power of 2.6 kilowatts. That's roughly what would fit on a carport roof above a typical parking space. Uh, freestanding solar nearby would also be okay. Uh, given that the average EV goes three miles for every kilowatt hour of energy its battery takes in, charging an EV at such a station for five hours would add 40 miles to the car's range, which should be enough extra mileage for more, most commuters. Um, these solar power stations can also be connected to the grid to ensure sufficient power on um, cloudy days. Um, now, it's very possible that we cannot legally specify an energy source in the zoning code. I'm not a zoning expert, so I don't know. But if the zoning code can specify EV charging stations, it seems a small leap to couple these stations to photovoltaic cells. Um, you know, in, uh, I guess I'm proposing this in the spirit of uh, the climate emergency and aggressiveness as long as there's a reasonable chance that such a requirement would pass legal muster, um, maybe we should include it. Then there's the added cost. That's a legitimate concern, but hopefully most future developments will be- 30 more seconds, all, Mr. Garber. Um, thanks. We'll be all electric like Valhalla. And referring back to that discussion, it may be more economical for developers to provide on-site solar electricity than to take on the cost of additional electrical infrastructure for the utility connection. So I think coupling solar to EV charging makes sense and that it's reasonable to mandate it. Thank you for considering it. Thanks. Thank you. If there are any other callers who wish to address the Planning Commission, please press star nine. Nobody else online. All right. I will close the public hearing and I will read the motion. The Ann Arbor City Planning Commission hereby recommends that the Mayor and City Council approve the amendments to Chapter 55 Unified Development Code Section 5.19 to require electric vehicle charging facilities as part of as part of the city's off-street parking requirements. Do you have a commissioner that will move? Moved by Commissioner Mills, seconded by Commissioner Sobey. Uh, we are in discussion, and I will first take a motion to extend the meeting till 1130, moved by Commissioner Mills, seconded by Commissioner Gibrandel. Any discussion on extending the meeting? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. We are extended till 1130, and uh, we are in discussion. Commissioner Gibrandel. Could the energy commissioners um, please discuss, you know, the whole solar component? It seems that you all were kind of nodding heads when uh, the, some of the folks had brought up whether or not you all had considered it. And, um, you know, this is newer to us. So I would love to hear your, your thoughts about including it, not including it. Obviously, the different sites have different opportunities. There's those kinds of things. But I would, you all are, are the experts in this. So I would like to learn from you. I'd be happy to do that. Um, and I think any one of the people that are on the working group would be um, welcome to chime in. Um, first of all, um, we've prepared a document um, that we will then um, also 
um, provide you, I don't know if it was um, given to you or not, but it'll be provided also to the Energy Commission and to City Council um, what, as to what our rationale is for not requiring a mandate. Um, so first of all, we, we very much agree with the, the logic behind um, having a renewable energy source supply all EV charging. Um, we think it's the right direction to move in. Um, but there's a number of reasons why we don't think it's um, both legal as well as realistic. Um, in terms of legality, um, what we would be doing is essentially saying if we can mandate um, renewable energy for a particular use, EV charging, then we could mandate um, renewable energy for any use. And it's our understanding that that would not be possible. It's not um, a question of you know, buying or selling or anything else and who's able to do that. It's just simply us in a parking um, ordinance um, mandating that people buy renewable energy for a particular use. And we don't think that's that's possible. It was, as was pointed out, um, A230 or excuse me, A20 um, targets 100% uh, renewable energy um, through CCA, um, Community Choice Aggregation or other means. Um, by 2030, um, actually the target is 2027, um, so it's before that. Um, in addition, um, if you um, think of having a mandate like this, then you also have to um, ensure compliance, and that means you also have to have some kind of enforcement. I mean, we could put something in there that says, here's a mandate, again, legality being a question, but how would we how would we even monitor that? The, the only way you can monitor that is if you then are requiring a separate meter to go to to the EV charging. That's an additional cost. Then you have to monitor that meter. Um, if someone upgrades from EV capable to EV um, installed, um, then. Um, let's say we go from 10, 10 spaces that are EV installed and some are upgraded so that it's doubled or tripled that amount, then how do we verify or how does the city verify that the, the amount of renewable energy that is provided to those spaces goes up correspondingly? Um, there's any number of serious scenarios that make that difficult. And then simply we think that tracking all of that with resources, with either a, an application, a database, um, going after people, that's counterproductive to what we're trying to do here. So we think there's any number of reasons for not doing that. Um, we, again, think all these reasons are good, um, including um, eliminating um, point sources of pollution in disadvantaged neighborhoods. There's lots and lots of good reasons. We've included language in the ordinance proposal recommending that a renewable source be used or contracted, but we don't think a mandate makes sense. And I'd like anybody else to chime in or to bore in on any of those particular points. I would only just add that I think the commission itself is probably well aware of its limits given the past discussions we even, I heard just tonight, um, you know, if we could just mandate it, we would support that, but we don't. We didn't really think it was in, within our jurisdiction as part of the parking uh, discussion, and we don't um, don't see yet that that's it's possible to mandate it for all new uh, construction uh, at this point. If I think it's also important to note there there may be, and I'm not sure that there is um, a municipality that is mandating it. But remember, laws are very different in California or in New York than what they are in Michigan. So just because that it's uh, done in another municipality somewhere else doesn't mean that that's transferable also to Ann Arbor and to Michigan. The provision we do have that encourages uh, consideration, um, you know, we think gives the Planning Commission the power to in engage in these discussions like I just heard with the previous projects. So um, if there's, you know, improvements that could be made there, um, we're, we're certainly open to them, but that's, this is the best that we've come up with so far. I also wanted to add that um, 
there are constraints that were mentioned in the previous discussion regarding shading and the location of some of these chargers. So that creates a lot more constraints. Um, in some cases, cost, of course, if, if, um, the initial capital cost. But it has been shown also that sometimes the cost of the wiring and the um, you know, trenching and all that could be actually more expensive than solar. So again, I think uh, leaving it open and, and recommending, it's, it's wiser at this point at the beginning while we're launching um, some effort like that, uh, rather than um, putting too many constraints. Uh, Commissioner Sauvain. So I'm in favor of this moving forward without it. One of the, when I try to think scenario planning for this, even just like the previous project, is understand, it's difficult to understand that all sites might be capable of producing 100% solar energy for the amount of EV on a site. And so there are going to be non-compliant sites with conflicting requirements where we might have three levels of underground parking on a dense D1 site where the roof is occupied by HVAC equipment and things that we can't put enough solar. So all of a sudden, conflicting requirements just don't line up to actually have everything happen on site. Um, that I could just see this causing more problems than, than creating solutions. And I think having the recommendation in there and all the kind of other components we can start to layer in maybe percentages of, you know, renewable energy powering these things in the future. But I think as a launching point, this, this has gone through a lot of due diligence. Um, I have two clarifications. I want, I just want to verify that this requirement is only for new site plans to city council. So I'm thinking of things like special exception use like a marijuana facility that doesn't go to city council, this wouldn't be required. And the same with like an administrative uh, site plan, this wouldn't be required, correct? Correct. Yeah, okay. Um, which I think is big because when you think about those retrofit costs, the idea of having somebody trying to retrofit a site and then having the exceptional burden of a compounding cost of this, uh, so yeah, I just wanted to verify that. Um, and I think graphic 519-2, EV charging only is labeled on the, the ADA parking space and it should be labeled to the adjacent space because you ha now have two layered requirements that an ADA van must be EV charging to be able to park in their a ADA designated space. So I think that graphic, we need the EV charging on the adjacent space so that they can plug in at a pole in between those two spaces. So I think that's something that needs to get updated before it gets adopted to make sure we don't have those conflicting uh, requirements for parking compliance. That's it for me. Commissioner Abrams, I think your hand was up, is that right? No, okay. Uh, further discussion? Uh, Commissioner Hammersmith and then Commissioner Mills. Thank you. I'm just curious when you you mentioned um, some of the other cities that you benchmarked and that you spoke to a couple of them. Did any of them indicate how um, their ordinances have impacted development? If it's, they've been seen favorable by the development community or if they're, they've had any issues since they adopted the ordinance? The um there were concerns that were presented by developers for um, Atlanta. I remember that discussion that we had with the city of Atlanta, but there's compliance, you know, subsequently. Okay, thank you. And the, the same thing happened, we, 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 right, Jeff, how many, how many uh, developers did we hear back from? There were some concerns about, about cost as well, and we addressed those concerns. It's just so much less expensive. Sorry, Jeff, go ahead. You're muted. <laughs> I'd like to point out real briefly, um, the E20 plan targets, granted this is a target, 
but it targets that 50% of miles traveled, vehicle miles traveled in Ann Arbor by 2030 um, will be by electric vehicles. So if we even come half of that, you know, Charles showed you some graphs, um, that is a huge demand on EV charging infrastructure. And it's gonna be very difficult to do that on existing structures, structures for the cost reasons that were shown. And that's why we think it's really important that we do it um, upfront when there's new construction. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm fully in support of this. I just also know how developers um, concerns that they may have sometimes. So just was curious how other cities were sort of addressing those concerns. Jeff, Jeff are you, you trying to talk a little bit? About it? We sorry, did, sorry about we that. Did do a fair um, amount in of, uh, in the outreach. correspondence material that we sent you all, uh, there was um, so a correspondence from a local representative of, um, of a pretty large um, property management group, and they had originally expressed concern about cost. Um, uh, they they got into some of the technical details in terms of construction. Uh, but basically, I think what they were saying is this is going to be costly for new construction and, I, you know, um, possibly increasing housing costs. Please be sensitive to that. Uh, Carlene, Charles, did you have anything else that you wanted to add about that? Well, I'll add something, um, which is that, you know, I think there was a lot of uncertainty around costs who was responsible, whether the utility contributes, et cetera. You know, the utility DTE is providing rebates to uh, help assist um, with uh, the installation of charging infrastructure for existing structures, as well as now the Public Service Commission just approved a $200 per uh, parking spot, you know, builder ready incentive. So that is now uh, available to developers to help offset some of those costs. And then, you know, Sarah could talk in more detail about sort of this kind of meta level, whether whether EV charging, our EV charging requirements might force, um, you know, higher uh, costs to upgrade the electrical infrastructure in particular neighborhoods. And they um, we got DTE to look at some of the particular, some of the sites, you know, currently before the commission and, you know, they actually found that there were either zero or minimal um, upgrades that would be required that they're sort of marginal to the projects themselves. So some of the projects might have required some upgrades. To the yeah. I mean, I think hopefully if the, your projections that you showed at the beginning of this are correct and just demand for EV um, wow, it's late. Um, and demand just goes higher than, you know, these, these early adopters in Ann Arbor will have, um, helped make, you know, their, their projects should just be like that much more competitive, I guess is what I'm trying to say. All right. Commissioner Mills. Yeah, I'll just tag on that. I think, um, I think I'm super, I'm really in favor of including the recommendation about pairing the charging with solar, in part because I think it's an educational opportunity. And I think that this also ties into the cost associated with this, right? Like our, the work that we had done to dig in to understand kind of what are the impacts and is this possible? So I think we talked about this at the work, when we talked about this at the working session, but what I wanted to know is, is this, are there going to be sites where our proposed ordinance is completely infeasible, that the grid can't handle it? And effectively we heard not most of the time, especially if you're talking about new construction and not retrofitting. And so I have a whole lot more um, comfort that it's possible and that there are actually programs to make it more affordable, but to, like people don't know about that. So I think that some of this is an education piece, and this is why I think including, even though our code doesn't typically include recommendations, right, it is, as as was noted kind of in the introduction, it's like, these are the rules, not this is what you we want you to do. Um, 
I think it's really smart and savvy here. And I think it is in keeping with the rest of our goals. So I am really in favor of this. I think kind of responding also to some of the, there was a letter I think in our packet about whether this is too high of a standard. First of all, what I like is that it applies to everybody, right? And like it's fair. <laughs> um, it's not picking and choosing. Um, and, I, and so I think that that's helpful. The other thing that I would say is, you know, requiring 100% seems like a lot, but it's going to take a long time for us to upgrade our infrastructure. And so um, it's not like overnight all of our parking lots are going to have 100% of their spots be EV eligible. And honestly, I think at least it, in some point, it's a marketing opportunity for these property owners. So this is, I, I thank you, um, Energy Commission and this particular team for all of the work that you put into this to make this easier for us um, to just like take something and, um, and, you know, be able to not have to go through all of the levels of ORC, like you did a lot of our work. So thank you. Um, I think that this will be great. And I would just suggest to us that um, there are some examples from other places, but in Michigan, this is one of the, I think it will be the most kind of aggressive forward thinking policy. It may be the first iteration of it and that's okay. Like zoning ordinances are not written in stone. If we're, if we're realizing that it's having unintended consequences, like we can amend it. <laughs> um, so I think that we need to know that, but but having this to be able to go so that we can help address that aspect of A20, I think is really helpful. So thank you all. Uh, Commissioner Abrams. Hi, um, I just wanna echo Commissioner Mill's gratitude uh, for putting the work in. I think this is an incredible effort. I know you guys have been, you all have been working on it for a long time. Um, I have a kind of small thing, which is I wanted to go back to the diagram of the ADA accessible parking stall that Lisa brought up and just make sure I understand. Maybe it would be helpful, Brett, if you could just pull it up. So um, I think that the, the stall that the EV charging only label is in right now is the van accessible stall. And my understanding is that below that table 5193 says there does need to be one van accessible EV parking spot, right? So I think if you move the label, as Lisa was saying, I think if you move the label to the other spot, then you no longer have a van accessible uh, EV charging spot. So I think either there's a kind of error here or it's just confusing and maybe needs to be clarified so that we don't end up causing confusion but maybe it'll be clear I think, that pulls it up. if i can add in though i think the contradiction is if somebody has to park if there's one accessible van spot and they do not have an ev vehicle right this labeling says you can only park there if you're ev charging no i might and fear, so my fear is that what's actually what's actually being required now is two van spots for every, wherever there only used to be one, we're now saying there has to be one regular spot and one EV spot. But maybe, cause you're right, Lisa, like you can't leave it this way. Otherwise, if somebody doesn't have an electric car but needs the van spot, they can't park there. Right, um, like you have to have an electric van or you get no ADA spot. <laughs> So I think that can't be, but maybe somebody on the, in the working group could help <laughs> clarify the intention. That was not our intention. Yeah. Um, what we wanted is that, though, that someone uh, who is driving an electric vehicle, um, a handicapped vehicle, that they are able to charge in a handicapped parking spot. So I don't know, we have to maybe work on the signage, um, but I hope that also uh, meets your, or uh, you, you agree with that, that thinking. But, but, that, but if you didn't have an electric van, you also could park in that spot. Correct, if you're handicapped. 
the idea is that you want there to be access to the charger in the event that the person who needs the van spot also has an electric vehicle. Correct. Um, so that makes sense. Yeah, I, that makes sense. But the diagram is contradicting that, right? Because mm -hmm. it says only. Uh, Does the graphic need to be there? Maybe, maybe it doesn't need to be there. Well, I'm also looking at the language, uh, I part one. So the second sentence says, where the table requires EVIs, at least one shall be adjacent to and accessible from an ADA compliant parking space. One shall adjacent to and accessible from. Okay, that makes sense. I think, I'll leave. Yeah, as I recall from the last like ORC or working session, yeah. this diagram basically said we could park an EV station in front of the hatched area so that, yep, so that either the van could use it or the adjacent parking spot. So it's always available in adjacency but may not be dedicated in case that van is an EV. Mm -hmm. The next parking spot over could also take that plug. So the EV charging only label, that's why I see. So that's what you're saying. You're saying it should be in the, the right-hand spot. Yes. The right-hand spot is for a non-ADA spot, but EV charging only. Yes. The left spot is the ADA spot. Could be optional EV charging. Yep. Because the EV charging charger is put in the middle of those two spots to be able to reach both cars. Mm -hmm. So that way, if you did park in the ADA spot, mm -hmm. you would still have a cord access to it. And yeah, EV charging only would be the adjacent spot. That makes sense. And then in the table, like if you need one van accessible and one standard accessible, that would be those two spots with the charger in between. That's a good catch. I think that's that captures exactly what we want. Um, and then I just had one other question. when. Um, when you were saying that it, you think it wouldn't um, hold up legally to require the solar charging, is that like is that something that went through our our legal staff, or is that something that you've gleaned from learning about other cities and their ordinances? It did not go through legal staff, to my knowledge. Yeah, but I think I think as part of the carbon neutrality goals, there are a lot of aspects relating to and what methods the city has the legal authority to incentivize, encourage, or require certain power sources be associated with the use of, of, of energy. Um, so I anticipate that um, that question being posed if it hasn't been already, um, but I don't think that the determination's been made. And I, I would agree with Mr. Mursky in that, um, until that that has, I, don't, I personally would put myself in that conservative camp that I don't know that I would want to sort of compromise the advancement and in, in, incremental progress that this ordinance would provide for our infrastructure um, with that potential question. Yeah, no, I, that makes sense. Um, and that's my last question is just about the EV capable category. Um, we just received a few different, a few comments. I mean, one, one from somebody that you actually, I think Charles was able to respond to in an email, um, but just about the sensibility of the capable category being something that is um, kind of easy to verify by inspectors or that makes sense financially. And I just wondered if you could just describe a little bit or just kind of describe maybe again the logic of the of the capable um, and maybe the kind of yeah counter argument to the to the ones that were laid out in the email which i can read if, if or i can refer and to I, specifically but you probably know what i'm referring to yeah yeah i think i am and uh, i mean basically you know there's there's different ways that cities have gone some just have ev readiness and defined as the wiring is in place um, 
others have you know this certain percentage of actual installed stations so that they're available and ready to charge a car whenever um, then there's others like the city of atlanta which went all sort of ev capable that direction it's a way to sort of reduce costs you don't put have to put the wiring in in until you're actually have met that level of demand we 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 like the ordinances that kind of split it three ways because we were able to sort of you know we, we anticipate you know a huge amount of of additional ev uh, evs you know over the next 10 20 30 years that a parking lot might exist um, at a structure but you know that it will slowly increase over time so we like the idea of having a certain amount of of the wiring already installed and circuits installed so that all you got to do is basically plug in a station um, but then still have the conduit there so that you don't have to go back in and rip up the parking lots the entrench um, and then add all of that additional infrastructure later so it's kind of a phased approach um, that we think offers you know it gives us the ability to have lower percentages for the actual wiring installed but doesn't preclude the the cost savings that comes from having the the conduit already in place and ready i think we even heard from you know the one of the projects tonight saying yeah we'll have the conduit there it'll make it easy to do later um so anyway i'll stop there well like there are concerns about it, the ability to like administer or enforce that uh, i don't know maybe staff yeah, that's a good staff question. I, I might add also that, um, you know, the, the table is the minimum requirements. If a developer says, well, I want to go ahead and make everything um, EV ready, pull all the wiring, um, put all the circuit breakers in, they can do that. Um, you know, if they think that um, doing it incrementally doesn't make sense for them, um, that's that's fine. If another developer says I would like to do this incrementally, that's fine. Um, in terms of determining um, this, basically, at an inspection time, all we're asking is that someone will go to the panel and verify that there's space in the panel um, for the additional circuits and that there's conduit installed um, to be able to pull wire at a later point in time. Um, you know, each one of these is easily physically identifiable um, by an inspector on site um, at the completion of construction. I think it will. I think it it is a new area for the city, and that we're going to have to figure out the best ways that we're taking a zoning requirement that is measured at a building permit inspection level. And um, this is something that we've discussed with this work group at the outset. Is that adds a complexity to this, and I do have concerns about it, but um, I think it's something that we will, uh, of course, approach and probably get better at with time. Um, so uh, I'll leave it at that. Oh, I, I do have one question, and I don't know if, if um, members of the commission could um, answer this, and I, I apologize for bringing it up to the work group. Is it, should we be referencing ADA or Michigan barrier free from parking standards? ADA. ADA, okay. That's national, yep. Okay, all right, thank you. We are getting close to our 11.30 time. So um, any further discussion on this item? Seeing no one, I think we're ready for a vote. And um, Mr. Leonard, if you can do a roll call. Commissioner Mills. Yes. Commissioner Milstein. Yes. Commissioner Gib Randall. Yes. Commissioner Ackerman. Yes. Commissioner Sove. Yes. Commissioner Abrams. Yes. Commissioner Hammerschmidt. Yes. Commissioner Woods. Commissioner Briggs. Yes. Carries unanimously. All right. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you to the work group for all your. We really appreciate it. Um, 
All righty. Um, can I get a commissioner who will move to extend us by 15 minutes? Moved by Commissioner Mills, seconded by Commissioner Abrams. Any discussion on uh, extending 15 minutes? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 We are extended for another 15 minutes. Um, moving on to organizational business and election of officers. Um, our first, uh, so tonight we're going to be nominating and voting on three officer positions, which is chair, vice chair, and secretary. And I would like to start with uh, nominations for chair. Come on, y'all want me to do it? I nominate Sarah. Oh, which one? <laughs> Oh, right. We have two. <laughs> Sorry. Sarah Mills. Me. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, Commissioner Mills, do you accept the nomination? I do, but if somebody else wants to take it, I am not, I will not be sad. All right. Are there other nominations? All right. Um, do we do a voice vote? Mr. Leonard on this? Um, I'm comfortable with that. All, right. All those in favor of uh, naming Commissioner Mills our next chair, please say you aye. I do need to have a motion. Oh, uh, it's been moved and was seconded by Commissioner Ackerman. Uh, so moved by Commissioner Gabrandel, seconded by Commissioner Ackerman. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Is this when I hand over the gavel and I'm out? Or do I finish this meeting? I don't, I didn't get sent the script. So uh, you gotta go through so you can tell people how to raise their hand and talk at public comment. All right, sounds good. <laughs> I'm finish this off and then you'll get the handy dandy script uh, for next meeting. Um, all right, uh, do I have nominations for vice chair? Commissioner Mills. Can I um, nominate Commissioner Gib Randall? Sugar Brandle, do you accept the nomination? I will accept the nomination. Seconded by uh, Commissioner Sove. Any other nominations? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Oh. All right. Congratulations, Commissioner Gibrandel. Um, do we have nominations for secretary? What does the secretary do? Uh, runs the meeting if the uh, chair and the vice chair is not, out. if they're not available. And you have to write an annual report about 100 pages. <laughs> but sometimes if there's a city council, if there's a master planning thing, you get your name on it. You get to sign it. Forgive wow. me for not knowing this, but who is, that, who is the current secretary? I'm the current secretary. I've run one meeting, so it's really not a heavy lift. It's your three road. It's your three year road to the top. Yeah, uh, there you go. <laughs> I think maybe Commissioner Abrams. Maybe I would um, uh, move to nominate Commissioner Abrams. So we have a motion to nominate Commissioner Abrams. Uh, I'm pretty sure she accepts. <laughs> End of uh, Commissioner Sauve. Uh, any further nominations or discussion? All right, seeing no one. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, congratulations. Um, moving on to review of bylaws. Um, it, it is late, and I know we got a stacked agenda next month. It's at your discretion. It has appeared in on the agenda in conformance with our bylaws. Um, but if you want to take some time tonight, that's fine. If you'd like to postpone until we have time, I, I really don't think it's critical that it be completed tonight. How about we postpone it until our first meeting in August? All right. We move that. We get a motion by Commissioner uh, Hammerschmidt, seconded by Commissioner Briggs. Uh, any other discussion? 
All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, it is approved. Um, all right, and for the last time, I will read this. Um, <laughs> participation. This is an opportunity for persons to speak for up to three minutes about any issue. City staff will select callers that have raised their hand one by one using the last three digits of your phone number. In order to electronically raise your hand to indicate your desire to speak, please press star nine on your phone. You'll hear an automated announcement um, that the host is allowing you to speak. Please state your name and address at the beginning of your comments. I'm sorry to say, Chair Milstein, that nobody is taking you up on your last offer. Excellent. Uh, commission proposed business. No, I will just say it has been an honor to serve as your chair, and I'm looking forward to just being a, a commissioner. So uh, I'm looking forward to talking a lot more other than reading. Um, all right, do I have a motion to adjourn? Moved by Commissioner Wood, seconded by Commissioner Abrams. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. We are adjourned. Have a great evening, and we'll see you guys next Tuesday. Thank Alex, you. thank you so much. Bye.